This program is brought to you by Cable Franchise Vs and generous donations from viewers like you. Good evening. Governor Baker's March 12th order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law allows us to hold this virtual town council meeting. Given that we have a quorum of the council present, I am calling the February 8th, 2021 meeting of the Amherst Town Council to order at 631. Each councilor by name. At that time, they should unmute their mic and say present. This will indicate that we can hear them and they can hear us. Please remember to mute your mic after you say present. The meeting is including video, audio, and is available live on Amherst Media. Uh, there is no chat room for this meeting. If you have a technical issue, please let Athena or me know. To make a comment or ask a question, please click raise hand button. And if technical difficulties arise as a result of util utilizing remote participation, I will decide how to address the situation at the time. Discussion may be suspended while we address technical issues, and the minutes will note if a disconnection occurs. Athena will be monitoring counselors' connections. Starting tonight, <coughs> excuse me, Lindsay McConnell, one of our current minute takers, will take minutes for the council meeting. And Athena will shift over to managing the Zoom, screen share, and tech support. Athena, however, will continue to record our motions and post those. So with that, I'm just going to call the council uh, and I'm going to start with Shalini Balmilm. Present. Thank you. Alyssa Brewer. Present. Pat DeAngelis. Present. Darcy DeMond. Here. Lynn Griesmer is present. Aunt Mandy Johanneke. Present. Dorothy Pam. Present. Evan Ross. Present. George Ryan. Present. Kathy Shane. Here. Steve Schreiber. Here. Andy Steinberg. Present. Sarah Schwartz. Present. Thank you. Uh, without much additional introductions, we're going to proceed to the announcements and we're going to show those on the screen. And I just want to note a few changes or additions. First of all, the Town Services and Outreach Committee. Athena, are you ready? Thank you. The Town Services and Outreach Committee meeting is now at five o'clock on February 11th. That is a change to accommodate the next meeting which is the Joint Capital Planning Committee meeting, which is on Thursday also, February 11th at, five, at seven o'clock. And you'll note there's several district meetings, one of which is rescheduled because of an unfortunate Zoom bombing, and that is District 5, and they will hold that meeting again on February 13th from three to five. Thank you. You can take the screen down, thank you. We're joined tonight by Senator Joe Comerford, Representative Mindy Dom, and the A-team from UMass, uh, headed up by Deputy Chancellor Steve Goodwin and John Kennedy, Vice Chancellor for University Relations. They're going to make a presentation about the opening of school, um, vaccinations, testing, et cetera. And in addition to that, the town of Amherst with Paul Bachman, Emma Dragon, Tim Nelson, and Mary Beth Ogilwitz, Ogilwitz will be making some additional presentation regarding vaccinations. To the extent that we have time within this hour, we will take questions, and, but I will also tell you that we've received questions from the public and we have advanced those to UMass. So without further ado, I will call on John Kennedy and we'll proceed. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you, Dr. Griesmer, for 
uh, inviting us to come and present to this group. Um, I just want to say at the outset that we value deeply our uh, collaborative relationship with the town mm -hmm. and we benefit greatly from our regular town gone working group meetings to help mitigate the uh, factors related to the pandemic. Uh, Paul Bauckham and Emma Dragon, uh, campus leaders in public health and our public health promotion center are in that group as well as Senator Comerford and, and Representative Dom. I also wanna say that we meet regularly and coordinate regularly with the State Department of Health and Health and Human Services uh, to coordinate our response to the pandemic. Um, could you advance to the next slide? Uh, uh, we're joined tonight by a group of my colleagues, uh, some of whom will present, some are here merely to answer questions if they come up in their particular areas. So just if you'll go on to the next slide, I wanna give you um, the next slide. Oh, okay. So uh, just to give you a sense of um, how we got to where we are. So, um, you know, our, our planning process throughout the fall was to figure out a way to begin to repopulate the campus in a way that was safe, um, in a way that served our educational mission. And to be clear that we are, are an immersive residential campus and the living learning uh, environment is, is our core business, our core mission. And um, we know that uh, the living learning environment is really um, a key element in student success, especially for first year students. Um, uh, the, the residential experience where uh, they're learning with their peers and in person uh, is a key part of student retention, progress toward degree and success as well. And in addition to that, a large portion of our students are first generation or low income and um, the campus environment really contributes to their well-being and their success. And we found in the course of the pandemic, uh, you know, reports from students who are in isolation and re learning remotely, taking a toll on, 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 on their mental health as well. And we standing up services to serve those students as well. So we want, so it was important to us to, again, try to transition back to what our, our core mission is to serve our students. So um, we, the, the, the plan we had for the spring anticipated um, uh, the ability to bring back about 60% of our residential students. That, that is uh, 14,000 students we house on campus. 60% um, was based on, um, again, an extensive assessment of what facilities would be needed, how they could be supported through testing, uh, what sort of quant uh, quarantine and isolation uh, facilities might be available. Only about 40% of the, uh, the on-campus, usual on-campus population took us up on that. So we have right now um, about um, 5,300 students living on campus and that includes um, RAs. 3,100 of those students are first years. And then a total of, of, of roughly 6,000 students enrolled in face-to-face -face classes, labs, and studios, which means that some of the in-person are also off-campus students. So we go to the next slide, please. Um, we've got 7,100 students living in Amherst and Pelham. Uh, 5,500 of those are undergraduate students, 1,600 graduate students, grad, graduate students in many cases tend to be year round. So that 5,500 undergraduate students um, uh, isn't much different from what we saw in the fall. Um, and we've um, that it, been able to do a much better job of sort of tracking their um, uh, residencies and their addresses. Um, during this period. So th that's sort of the status of where we are in terms of student population and where they are. If we'll go to the next slide, um, I just sort of talk about how we got to the current situation and, and the steps we're taking to um, deal with it. Um, next slide. So, uh, okay, so we appear to be missing a slide. I apologize. So I'll just lay this out for you. So from, oh, there we are. Okay. Uh, from February 2nd, uh, so we brought students back uh, a week prior or in the weeks prior to courses beginning on February 1st. And there was a Jeff and Ann Becker can talk about the onboard testing that was done to ensure that they were, um, uh, you know, that everyone was self uh, safe and healthy. 
uh, students were quarantined before classes began. Um, and, and it wasn't until the first week of classes from February 2nd to 4th that we saw a surge in positivity rates on campus. Uh, by late last week, we got to about um, 298 uh, positive tests, um, uh, which resulted in our decision to um, change what we call the operational posture of the campus from um, guarded to elevated. Uh, and, and you can t take a look at all this, it's on our websites, but elevated essentially meant that we were, that we made a decision to significantly uh, clamp down on activities on campus. So it meant uh, no student gatherings whatsoever. The dining halls would remain closed, even though we were eventually planning to open them for, in, uh, for seated dining. The rec center would remain closed as well. And a host of, number, a host of additional restrictions were put in place. Um, throughout the day on Friday, the numbers were still ticking up. Um, on Saturday, we got together with um, uh, Secretary Sutter's Health and Human Services Secretary and a number of officials from the State Department of Public Health, um, uh, town officials, Paul Bachman and Emma were in that meeting, discussed uh, and laid out what the situation was on campus. Mm -hmm. By late Saturday, um, we realized with the elevated the numbers the that, that we really had no choice but to even ramp up the risk level even higher. So Sunday morning, we announced that uh, the campus operational posture was going to go from elevated to high. And high uh, is really uh, quite an extensive set of restrictions that come down on campus. And the measures implemented meant that we've suspended all in-person classes, transitioned everything to remote. All students on campus or off are required to self-sequester, meaning they need to stay in their residences. Students are only allowed out twice Week, for their twice weekly COVID testing to get food or, to, or for medical necessity. And we made it very clear to students and we'll continue to make clear to students that failure to comply will result in disciplinary action. It could include removal from the residence halls. It could include suspension, et cetera. We also suspended uh, all campus uh, athletic competitions and practices. Um, and and um, these, uh, this situation is in effect for a minimum of 14 days. Uh, so February 21st is the earliest that um, some of the uh, restrictions here could be lifted, but they will only be lifted if the public health situation improves significantly. So this is a, a, a pretty major, uh, well, a, a, a very major uh, step that we've taken in order to um, get a hold of this surge we've had in positive cases. And again, these moves were made in consultation with state officials. Um, uh, we've again been uh, to the, to, uh, to collaborative with uh, Paul Bachelman and Emma in there, and Emma Dragon and their staff, and we could want to continue to work very closely with them as we move forward. So with that, um, that's the current status of where we are. I'm going to hand it over to Steve Goodwin, who's going to talk about the, how we make the data-informed decisions that we do in what our um, approach is from an epidemiological perspective. So if we go to the next slide, and Steve Goodwin will take it from here. Thanks, John, and um, especially thanks to the council for this opportunity. This time couldn't be more timely. Um, this is exactly the right time for us to be having this conversation, so thank you all. Um, what I want to do with my two minutes is to essentially talk about the process that led to those decisions and actions that John just described to you. Um, very early on in the pandemic, the Chancellor put together a public health response team. And um, that team consists of the um, director of public health on the campus, Ann Becker, and the director of environmental health and safety, Jeff Heshcock, who together form the uh, public health promotion center that's really been responsible for the management of uh, COVID-19 responses on our campus. And both of them, both of those two individuals are on the call tonight and will be able to also um, provide you with additional information and answer um, questions. That public health response team has been meeting daily for um, almost nine months now. And essentially what it does is it looks at the public health situation both on the campus and off the campus. And based on their assessment, um, makes recommendations for our campus actions. So in addition to Jeff and Ann, on that team, we have two professional epidemiologists who are on our faculty. 
we have the director of University Health Services as well, who has extensive experience in infectious disease. We also have two participants, one from student um, affairs and campus life, and one from university relations who help with the communications to make sure that there's a two-way flow and that one hand knows what the other hand is doing. So it's a team that's been together for a very long time evaluating the situation. Based on our experiences in the fall and the experiences of some other universities as well, we put together that set of operational postures that's been referred to and that is available on our website. Essentially, um, those operational postures give four different risk levels for the campus, depending on the assessment of the public health situation, and also the options for campus responses at each of those four levels. So um, just last week, there was a very steep rise in the number of cases. And by steep, I mean extremely steep. There was nothing gradual about it. There was a very sharp rise in the number of cases that the public health response team made an immediate recommendation to the campus that we should go to elevate it as John just described to you. The campus did in fact adopt that posture. And at the same time, we contacted the town of Amherst, both Emma Dragon and Paul Bachelman um, to let them know about the situation. And we contacted the Massachusetts Department of Public Health so that we made sure everybody could start to participate in thinking about the appropriate responses to the situation that existed. Um, on Friday, Paul had some conversations with the uh, Secretary of Health and Human Services. The Chancellor had some one-on-one -on -one conversations. I had some one-on-one -on -one conversations. And we decided that the best approach would be to have that meeting on Saturday where we could bring the state contact traces together with the appropriate people in, um, in the Department of Public Health and Health and Human Services, as long, along with getting input from Amherst, the town of Amherst itself, in order to um, decide what would be the best practices moving forward. The campus did decide, in fact, as John said, to move to elevated, excuse me, to move to high risk and to put in the additional restrictions that, um, that he's described. And so I think that, um, that we have a very, we had a very good place to, in order to make these decisions. I think we've made a good series of decisions and I think we'll use the same um, response team as we decide where we are as time progresses. And so what we'd like to do is give you a little sense of exactly where we think we are right now in terms of testing, quarantine and isolation, contact tracing and vaccination. And I think I'm gonna pass it over to uh, Jeff next to talk a little about um, testing. Great, thanks. If you go to the next slide, please. Uh, next slide. And one more, please. Great. All right, good afternoon. Uh, good evening, everyone. Hope everyone is doing well. So as uh, John and Steve kind of alluded to, we started welcoming back students actually in mid-January. That included our residential uh, RAs and, and peer mentors. And we started our on-campus welcome back to campus kind of quarantine. What that meant was individuals would come to the Mullen Center to get their keys as also getting their COVID-19 test. And then they were told to basically self-sequester um, in their dorm room until they got two negative tests. So they would just do grab and go for days one through four, or actually one through five, they would come get tested on day four. And then upon their day five tests, you know, then they were a, they would be eligible to then go to in-person classes and then go eat in the dining halls. Obviously we have continued uh, grab and go, but that was the two big factors in terms of allowing the on-campus quarantine was, um, two negative tests within five days, and then that would allow them to go to in-person classes or go to grab and go. 
our onboarding tests and our percentage was very low. You know what I mean? It was uh, approximately about 1%. So in terms of the onboarding testing, um, much lower than the state rate. And as John and Steve kind of alluded to, kind of last week was when we started to see a rise in cases. You know, we did approximately 17,000 tests last week and our campus positivity rate was about 2.46. Uh, the state's was approximately 3.1. If you wanna to go to the next slide, please. So during this time, we've had a proc, uh, 406 positive cases during that time. As you can see, 399 of them are students and seven of them are staff. The one thing I just wanna express is that we've not seen any transmission from students to employees um, during this, you know, and this is part of kind of social distancing and mask wearing that, that we've seen on campus. You know, you're here a little bit later, but what, what we are seeing is we, you know, is some of the students are not following some of the social distancing and mask wearing measures. And that's where this enhanced, um, posture where we've gone to to elevate continue to elevate is we'll continue to reinforce that message when, when we've been putting together since day one if you want to go to the next slide please so if you can see the split it's rough it's roughly the same about 208 on campus 191 positive tests uh, uh, 191 off campus you know as folks know you know through the fall semester as we come through the spring semester we have one of the largest asymptomatic testing centers um, not only in the commonwealth but in the country so in terms of the testing you know the twice a week all students are getting it doesn't matter if you live on campus if you live off campus attending classes or not attending classes so this large asymptomatic testing center you know has been able to identify these positive cases and then we're working extremely closely with mass department of public health we also have an extensive contact tracing team and coordinate uh, um, isolation and quarantine team and as through last week progressed you know obviously we started working more with dph and they've helped to assist us through the um, contact tra tracing collaborative on assisting us with the off-campus student case investigations uh, we're primarily focusing on the on-campus case investigations and they're assisting us during the increased cases with the off-campus one. So that again shows the partnership continuing to do there with the Commonwealth. If you can go to the next slide, please. So as we continue to work, you know, closely on this, you know, as kind of the three-legged stool, I would say it's testing, it's contact tracing, and then it's isolation and quarantine, which is the last component of this. So again, we offering space on, you know, on campus as part of when we were doing this from the fall, continuing here to the spring, which includes three free meals a day in our location. We've continued to add to our isolation and quarantine location and spaces here on campus um, to support our mechanism in terms of um, the in, in increased cases that we've seen to be able to support those students. You know, we've strongly encouraged um, really not wanting to them go home, but we want them to stay here from that perspective. Um, we want them to stay, um, you know, in our location so they can isolate and quarantine and, and not go home during this time. So that's something we've been strongly messaging. We send them specific guidance and documents about quarant um, quarantine and isolation, you know, which this is even above and beyond of what DPH sends, because there's particular information in there about academics, following our protocols, again, with the Dean of Students Office from, from that reach, from that perspective. I'd also say <clears throat> from the fall with the spring semester, as we talked about, you know, from the team that we've continued to increase, that includes testing. You know, you'll hear from Ann in a second to talk about the community testing and vaccines that we're also doing as part of this. But from that three-legged stool I referred to of testing, contact tracing and isolation and quarantine we continue to during the fall winter getting ready for the spring semester is increase our staffing to be able to support um, our campus so from a preparedness standpoint kind of we're there in terms of of working closely um, with the state and the town on this increase in cases and as we continuing to work together in terms of you know our contact tracing and then the isolation and quarantine, getting them isolated and quarantine as fast as we can, you know, we're gonna bring down the cases um, immensely, you know, quickly is, is what we're working on diligently, 
every day, every night from that perspective. So with that, I'll pass it over to you, Ann, to talk a little bit more about community tech testing and vaccinations. Thank you. Next slide, please. And, and next slide. So we are um, feel it's such a great privilege that uh, sometime in uh, November, uh, our testing center at the Mullen site uh, was able to expand our on-campus testing, asymptomatic testing into the community. And we were able to do that this because um, our IELTS department um, actually stood up a clinical laboratory. We call it ICTC. Because of that, we were able to offer testing to our community members. Um, we've done it since uh, December or, or third week of November, and we've uh, now conducted about 14,000 tests since the community uh, testing opened. Um, we took a pause for a week while we were onboarding our students, as Jeff referred to, and um, now we're open three days a week by appointment only. Um, and we can going, plan to continue offering this throughout the semester. Next slide, please. As part of the, um, Jeff referred to the three-legged stool, we've turned our three-legged stool into a, a, to a chair. And the fourth prong is vaccination. Um, so we have testing, we have isolation and quarantine, and we have um, uh, contact tracing, and now we've started our vaccination. Uh, we're starting week four. Um, we began uh, in January with the um, first responder clinics, and we've been doing vaccination clinics that are open. We're designated as a regional vac vaccination site um, from the State uh, Department of Health. We were um, working closely with Health and Human Services on this, and uh, we have been providing vaccinations now from all of phase one, and we are really thrilled um, to be now into phase two, step one, which is the 75 and older, as, just as Emma has been doing in the town, we're also doing it. So we've, so far, as of the close of last week, we have conducted 4,000 vaccinations and um, we have over 1,700 vaccinations planned uh, this week. We have a clinic going on currently. This is mostly dose two today and uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday of this week. We have filled appointments um, for dose two and dose one for over 75. And um, we are uh, staffing these clinics, and I just need to give a shout out to our students and um, our contact tracers. These are public health students. These are nursing students. These are student EMTs who are giving back to the community. They are happy. They are joyous to be working and doing these, these uh, community comp uh, uh, contributions, especially the vaccinations. They just... Uh, the students are lining up to be able to uh, work at them with us and to uh, start uh, mitigating the effects of this pandemic. And I think that's our last slide. Yes, is it? Yep, I'm up next. Uh, next slide, please. So you can go to the next slide as well. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, the continued work that we're doing in partnership uh, with many of the folks that are here. Um, we have longstanding relationships with Amherst Police, Amherst Fire, Inspection Services, um, Town Hall, you know, it runs the gamut. And so we're very much in partnership with our off-campus outreach and education in particular. Um, and we take a really multifaceted approach. Um, so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about some of the ways we're um, strategically reaching our off-campus students. This is not by any means an inclusive list, but sort of gives you a, a general um, sense of the strategy and the multiple ways that we're um, addressing our communities that live off campus. Um, and then I'll turn it over to um, Dean Evelyn Ashley who will talk a little bit more about 
the pandemic directives and expectations. So um, one of the most critical pieces of our outreach involves students. So we know that students are often the most effective communicators with their peers in terms of accountability, responsibility, and sharing um, the message of good public health behaviors. So we're continuing to engage our team positive presence. They are the folks in the bright blue jackets that you'll see down, down at Mullen Center. Um, and you'll see them, at least not at the present time, but last semester you probably saw them in your neighborhood um, with some of us. And the Pe Peer Health Ambassador Network who are do doing some of the work. They're also working remotely. So I would add to that list that we are actively engaging um, with Student Government Association as well as our um, fraternity and sorority leadership councils as they're um, heavily and increasingly getting invested in um, sort of having some peer-to-peer -peer accountability and standards um, for, for their behavior within chapters. Um, we also do a series of direct emails to off-campus students from off-campus student life. So for this weekend, ex for example, specific messages around living in community, resources, um, places to get uh, food delivered, you know, while that you're um, self-sequestering and that sort of thing, being a good neighbor. Um, and we're able to segment and target those specifically to our off-campus students. Um, and I'm really proud that I have very high red rates and open rates on my emails. Um, so that tells me that there's, they find relevance in what we're sharing, which is great. We meet every Monday uh, at one o'clock with our um, first responders from the town of Amherst, Sunderland and Hadley and our conduct staff, our um, student engagement, university relations inspection services, and we share sort of what happened over the weekend, what we might be anticipating um, for the upcoming week. Um, we share incident reports, sort of strategically problem solve. It's been a longstanding relationship that's really critical to sharing information, keeping our eyes open and ears open, and having um, triaging the appropriate follow-up there. We have been meeting weekly with our Greek house directors. So those are the uh, adult professionals that manage the zone chapter houses. There are 11 in Amherst. Only 10 of them are occupied at the present time. Um, but we meet on a weekly basis with them to check in on their pandemic policies, to check in on how things are going, to set expectations, answer questions, that sort of thing. You probably have seen Team Positive Presence at the Mullen Center. They're a pretty welcome face down there. Um, they've been highly active since the beginning of the spring semester as well. Um, just last week, they were down there on Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday. There was snow in the midst of that, so they canceled one day. And just for a, a, a point of um, importance, they interacted with almost 3,500 people, just directing people into the appropriate line, whether it's the community testing side or the university testing side, answering questions, making sure people are keeping distance. and um, you know, sort of just being a friendly face um, as, as people are there. So we will be continuing that um, outreach and presence. It's also another opportunity to give just in time information. So we share things about governor's directives and that sort of thing. We have um, continued to do our, our great work with uh, addressing tenant, neighbor, and landlord issues, particularly in some of the communities where there may be um, rental properties next to permanent residents. So we've done that proactively with Bill Laramie from the police department and John Thompson in inspection. We've done those in person. Uh, sometimes at Mill River, we'll set up over there and socially distance. It's been wonderful. Uh, we've had some great meetings there. And we also extend those to do Zoom. And we found that doing those in a Zoom setting, everybody's available, everybody's at home, and it, you can really have a good conversation. So we'll be continuing that. Our walk and talk with Winston, the, the ever famous comfort dog, um, and Bill Laramie, um, were, those are just on hold, obviously, for the present time, given our, uh, our status. But we're looking forward to a nice spring where we can go out and continue to do our neighborhood presence, interacting with our residents and students. And um, we have great collaboration from our apartment communities. Um, we have uh, shared all the public health messaging from our uh, from the university campaign. We distribute masks for them to give to tenants. We share all the university communication that is going to our students with them and um, find them to be tremendous partners. 
Um, so um, the last thing I might add to this is that um, we are actively advising and working with our, our student leaders around how they might engage in helping to spread the word within their own social networks. So uh, we're pretty excited about that. I think that's all I got. And so now Thank I think it's Evelyn. Think Evelyn is next here. Yep. Next slide. Thank you. Thanks, Sally. So I'll, I'll give a little bit of information about our pandemic directives and expectations. Um, next slide. So this semester, rather than the community agreement that we asked students to sign um, at the beginning of the fall, we implemented an interim pandemic policy that allows us to um, better identify where our students are actually living because we have requested that they provide us their physical address. It also allows us to track violations that are specific to the pandemic policy to be able to better hold students accountable for specific violations related to um, not wearing their mask or um, the back to campus quarantine that we ask students to participate in. Next slide. So you can see that from the beginning of the year, um, we have had referrals to the Office of Student Conduct and Community Standards. Um, we've had 354 to be exact um, as of Friday of last week. 332 of those are students who reside on campus. Um, those referrals have come to us from a variety of places, mostly from our resident assistants who are living in the halls with our students. Um, for those students who are referred, um, they have received a behavioral notice letting them know that they need to make sure that they are participating or behaving in the way that we expect that they would behave. Um, we have seen very few um, students who have had repeat behavior from, the, from receiving a behavioral notice. From those students who have been re repeat offenders, we have followed up with them and issued the appropriate sanctions. Um, next slide. Some of the sanctions that we have imposed this semester um, have included a suspension, removal from on-campus housing, um, housing probation, or uh, a reprimand. Um, this is something that we do take very seriously and we want our students to know that we are serious about making sure that we are maintaining the health and safety of all of our students. And sometimes that does mean removing some students from our community in order to be able to, to do that. So um, we have taken those steps when it has been necessary. One of the things that we are also doing is when um, we do have to remove someone from campus, we are able to engage um, parents or family members or others who support our students to ensure that when a student is required to leave campus that they are actually leaving campus and, and going back to their home so that they are not becoming a problem within the community. So um, we are trying to make sure that we take steps to ensure the health and safety of everyone that is on campus at this point in time. So with that, John, I will turn it back over to you. Okay, we'll just go to the next slide then. And I promise we're wrapping this up here. We just wanted to th uh, thank you for taking the time to uh, uh, hear our um, the steps that we're taking. And again, we're committed to the collaboration with the town. Um, and uh, if you want more information about the work that we're doing, um, you can go to our website, www.umass.edu slash spring, has the spring plan, has uh, information about um, our operational postures. And I think probably of most interest to many of you will be uh, our, our dashboard, which shows you what the um, case level is. Um, so with that, we've concluded our portion of the presentation and I'll kick it back to you, Lynn. Thank you. Uh, Paul, I'm gonna have you and the team from the town uh, proceed immediately as soon as we get your slides up, okay? Sure, so while well, Athena does that, uh, again, Paul Bockelman, town manager, and uh, Emma Dragon, who's our health director, who's been working literally day and night, seven days a week, like many of us on this call have been doing. So just thank her for the work that she's doing along with 
all the other team. And she's going to really walk through uh, this slide deck. So if you can go to the next slide, Athena. Emma? Hi, Emma Dragon, new health director. Um, and, and I thank you, Paul, for, for noting that. I know so many of us are working around the clock, but it's meaningful work and it works that it's work that has to be done for our community. So here we can see the current Amherst case counts as of this morning. This We had 467 active cases in Amherst, 22 new cases since yesterday for a cumulative amount of 1,514 cases, uh, which does reflect the significant increase of 334 cases in the past five days. Next slide. Here we can see a visual of a little graph. I love um, these that kind of show that sharp increase that I know John Kennedy spoke about earlier with the recent increase in cases. Next slide. And we did have that meeting on Saturday with state legislatures from Department of Public Health, as well as Secretary Sutters, many on the UMass A team that are here tonight, myself and Paul Bachelman. In addition to the efforts that UMass has noted that they're putting in place, we felt very strongly to help assure the public health firm community that we needed to take additional community public health action. In response to that, we did an emergency Board of Health order that will reinstate and has reinstated the early closure that was expired on January 25th uh, to reinstate that certain businesses will close by 9.30 p.m. each night, which is due to, um, due to, which was due to expire, but is being extended until it is rescinded and then to continue the 25% capacity limits for sector businesses um, at 25% until otherwise rescinded. We know that transmission uh, is due to exposure. So if we are able to de-densify and help encourage these students to be in compliance with the directives of the university, uh, then we can help assure public health mitigation efforts. Next slide. And this is the phase that we are in currently for vaccine. Uh, I know Ann Becker talked about how nice it is to be entering phase two with those individuals age 75 and older, I just want to echo that we have had a great time this past week welcoming those individuals that are in that first phase two category and really sharing the joy with them in their moment. For many of these individuals, they have not really been out of their home and into the community and, and been with others for, for quite some time, almost a year now, and being able to share uh, an inclusive moment with them, cheering them on with being here in the community uh, and celebrating this next stage of, stage of vaccine administration, especially here in Western Mass has been really grateful for me and has helped fill my cup. Next slide. So here we can just kind of see what we have done on at our town of Amherst site for vaccines on the local level. Um, I just like to say we have gone from a very small health department with myself, uh, Jennifer Brown as the public health nurse and a part time administrative assistant to a robust team of volunteer support working alongside our fire department. I just want to thank Chief Olmstead, uh, Chief Nelson and um, Assistant Chief Olmstead for their assistance with helping our paramedics work alongside us, partnering with the school nurses on this and countless other community volunteers that have joined us at the table to help be able to distribute vaccines. To this date, um, we have distributed 2,000 over a little bit over 2,000 vaccines in just three weeks, and I think that's just an amazing thing to note that we have been able to do on a on a small local public health level. Next slide. 
And going forward, we will be continuing to have clinics. Um, many ask when will we be posting dates for those clinics availability. One of the things that we really want to be assured of is that if anyone signs up for a clinic that we're going to have those doses available for them. I think many of us know how limited the capacity and availability is of vaccine going forward. We are working with our legislatures, um, Senator Comerford and, and Representative Dome and others to bring vaccine here to Western Mass. Uh, so we do hope that by the end of February, we'll be able to have uh, 3,500 shots in arms about. And also, yes, UMass serves as that regional site. They are doing an amazing job as well. Uh, and we just really help direct people to them um, when we don't have availability here at our site as well. Next slide. And for more information, you can continue to look at our AmherstCOVID19.org back front slash vaccine site. You can, uh, can advise individuals that might have questions or need help registering on our town site to our COVID concerns hotline at 413-259-2425. Individuals that live, are seniors that live in Amherst and Pelham can reach out to our senior center at 413-259-3060. Or if they live outside of our communities, they can be helped directed back to their local senior centers that'll be able to help them sign up. And individuals can also email our COVID concerns email if they have any questions for sign up and vaccine availability. Next slide. I think that's it. Yeah, so I just want to note one thing um, to conclude. So thank you, Emma. Yeah. Um, this has been uh, a, a, a really arduous process, but over the weekend we did coordinate with our neighboring towns of Sunderland and Hadley. So they are both um, putting forward the same kind of uh, restrictions that the town of Amherst has. Um, and so it's really good to uh, pull them together and to respond uh, as a region to the spike that we're seeing um, among our student residents right now. That concludes our report. Great. I'm going to start off with a couple of questions I know we have coming from the audience. One goes to UMass Amherst, and it is to ask, will people continue to be able to get shots on UMass Amherst campus, and where is that happening? So, uh, I'll go ahead, Jeff. So, this, so yes, the vaccine clinic testing set, uh, the vaccine clinic and the community testing center are both open, um, and we want everybody to continue to schedule their appointments as part of it. Uh, the vaccine clinic is located in the basement of the campus center auditorium, and they can park in the garage, and they'll get a free parking voucher. Thank you. Um, second question. Again, this goes to you, Mass. If you read the collegiate you would feel that there was one fraternity that particularly caused a lot of the outbreak. Could you speak to that, speak to the investigation into that and how you will make that transparent to the public? Could I, could I start with this and then maybe Evelyn uh, could take it from there. Um, the, the collegiate story um, was very concerning to us, no question about it, but that uh, I think um, sort of exemplifies one of the challenges we have because the sources in the collegiate story were all anonymous, right? So getting evidence upon which we can act is a real challenge. And that is, um, you know, also raises the issue of um, how we've tried to take it ed more of an educational approach with regard to student violations because we need cooperation. So uh, Evelyn, do you want to update folks on where that is? Oh, we did one other thing I want to be clear on is that there's, I think, been a sense that, you know, there was one singular super spreader event that got us to this point. All the evidence that we've seen is that it's, that's in fact not the case. Uh, that these were smaller sort of casual interactions that got us here. But anyway, I'm going to hand it over to, to Evelyn to sort of give us a little more on that. Thank you for sharing that, John. I appreciate you, you talking about the fact that we are using the data to inform our, our, our processes. Um, for the fraternity that has been named, the, they, um, we have taken action to be able to investigate the claims that have been made about the fraternity having a party. So the staff in the Office of Student Conduct and Community Standards are investigating that. There is a process that has to um, take its run its course. So they will investigate. Um, and then if it's necessary, we will make sure that 
um, if they are found responsible, then there will be sanctions that the fraternity does have to comply with. Um, as far as the transparency piece is concerned, it is all, it's our, our process to share what we're able to as far as what we find um, and what the outcome of the, our investigation is. So could I just add one thing to that, Lynn? So, because um, I've been guilty of this myself a few times where I've kind of um, reacted to uh, a rumor I heard or a, a piece I might have seen or even video and multiple times it turned out not to be correct. And so I think it have given process a little bit of time to um, play forward it is important. The other thing I, I just want to say, because she's put so much Herculean effort into this, is that Anne has spent a huge amount of time working with fraternities and sororities on the educational side, on the, um, but also on a fairly strong um, response back when there has been inappropriate behavior, including interactions with the nationals who can then put pressure back on the fraternities and sororities themselves. So I think there's, there's a two prong approach, both the investigations, but also continuing to work with those um, organizations to try to improve behaviors. Uh, before I go to counselor comments and questions, I'm going to just note that there are 79 people in the audience. So this is an extremely well attended meeting. Uh, with that, counselors have also been gathering questions from their constituents. And I'm going to turn to George Ryan first. Thank you, Lynn. Um, two very quick questions, if you will. Um, the first actually comes from a constituent. It's uh, really addressed to UMass, has to do with apparently the university does not test positives a second time. Um, and apparently the World Health Organization recommends that to avoid uh, getting uh, false positives. So a question, uh, why does the university not test uh, positives a second time just to ensure that? Um, the second, um, in my experience already just today, uh, where students are congregating, understandably, I can certainly sympathize with them, is health clubs. And I'm wondering what advice and help you can offer to the folks in those situations. Um, students are coming to the health clubs um, and uh, they're UMass students. Um, what advice, help can you offer them? What are they supposed to do? They feel sort of between a rock and a hard place. So uh, question about false positives, question about in particular about health clubs and, and the role that putting small business people or staff uh, in the situation of being enforcers, what help can we give them? What advice? Do you want to, John, you want to start? Yeah, on the, on, I'll start with the second one first. Um, you know, we, we would encourage uh, any folks who have, uh, you know, anything to report about student conduct to let us know, uh, Dean of Students Office and other entities, and then we can follow up. Um, but you know we need concrete information to to act upon because you know we're 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 you know, we're limited in our ability to uh, police and enforce beyond the borders of the campus. So we need collaboration with the community. Um, I don't know if uh, I, I just do the false positive. Yeah. So first of all, George, it's nice to see you. It's been a very long time since I've seen you. So um, I would say we're um, we want to use our resources most efficiently. We're less worried about false positives because even if it's a false positive, we're still taking the same public health measures in terms of isolation and follow up with close contacts. We're actually more concerned with false negatives because those are uh, those are potentially infected individuals who are slipping through the an analysis. And so that's why we went to twice a week testing to try to uh, minimize the impact of false negatives. Mandy Jo Haneke, please. Thank you. Um, two questions. I think most of these are actually directed more towards our public health director. Um, number one, and maybe this one's a UMass one, are we sequencing the UMass positive cases? Uh, mainly to determine since there was quite an explosion all at once, if this explosion is related to any of the more contagious variants, including the ones from the UK and South Africa and other locations, are we going to be able to find that out at some point? Um, and then the second one is in the fall, we found out that UMass clusters, when contact traced, didn't really involve community members, um, non-student community members. Let me let me rephrase that because um, because our students are community members. Um, but and so I guess my question is, 
when we're contract tracing this entire cluster or multiple clusters, as it were, um, are the resulting quarantines or the close contacts of the students that are testing positive involving non-students or non-UMass affiliated individuals? Um, and, and I ask that because it didn't happen in the past and we're seeing a whole lot different um, response to this cluster, albeit it's lot, a lot larger than we did in the fall in terms of community um, crackdowns. I'll, I'll go ahead and answer the variant portion of that question and then Ann can probably um, pick up on the contact tracing. So one of the very good things that came out of the Saturday meeting was an agreement to work with the Department of Public Health to do some sequencing of the positive cases at UMass to look for variants of SARS-CoV-2. So um, that the logistics of that are actually being worked out as we speak, and we there aren't any results yet, but we do expect to um, be getting some analysis for variants very soon. And Ann, maybe pick up on the contact tracing. Sure. So for this particular um, you know, cluster that we're going or uh, going through right now, we have a surge. We're finding that overwhelmingly it's in our undergraduate student population. It's being transmitted student to student. Um, we don't, we are not seeing any kind of transmission um, either to faculty or staff or into community. I, I actually had that conversation with uh, Emma about that the other day. And right now we're not seeing any evidence of that. Hope that answers the. Thank you. Uh, Dorothy, Pam. Okay, so all the students were tested and then they waited a few days and then they were tested. And then they came here and then it rose. So my question is, did you not in fact test all of them or is perhaps the protocol flawed that the time intervals between declaring things okay was not good enough? Because if you bring a bunch of people and you're, they all test negative and you wait, I really just can't see how they, this rise could have happened. Um, so that's my question. I'm, I'm just thinking that maybe you're assuming they're okay before they are, that there's a longer lag between um, being a carrier and it showing up in the tests. So Dorothy, you asked the toughest question of them all. Um, so, and um, a part of this answer is going to be that there's still more for us to learn. There's still more to be determined. But what we can say right now is that we, going into this, we know that there would be some number of false negatives. And that's why we tested twice. That's why we asked students to self sequester during that period of time. And, um, it, it may be that more students fell, fell through that net than we were anticipating or that we were modeling for, but we still have, we have to look at this a little bit more in depth. And I'm just gonna add to, to Steve, you know, as part of the Commonwealth's kind of travel guidance, where it says like you can arrive with a 72 hour negative test and, you know, and that doesn't even account for even within the own our own state, as we know, there's a lot of towns that were that are in red. You know, we exceeded what the governor's guidelines were. Is you know, we appreciated students that would arrive with a 72-hour test um, as part of it coming from out of state, um, as part of it because that's a part of the requirement from the Massachusetts gov. Um, but f just following their guidance, then they would have been eligible to kind of take the in-person classes. So doing the day one and then the day four uh, testing, you know, and we followed other universities that are around in terms of following those protocols as part of that. The one thing I just, I failed to mention earlier too is, you know, in terms of kind of being not alone, there is other universities that, that are out there too, Villanova, Villanova, Michigan State, UC Berkeley, other schools that are kind of in the similar situation where we are. Um, and we've been communicating with them too as part of uh, additional cases, you know, and some of them aren't even testing like we are. They're, the surveillance testing doesn't even meet even a, uh, a lick of what our expectations are. So as part of our additional testing, as part of it continuing to catch it 
and the quicker and the, you know, the quickness of us being able to contact trace and then get them in isolation or quarantine. Thanks. Steve Schreiber. Hi, thank you so much for doing this. So I have two questions like everyone else. The first one is, at what point do we reach the events of March 9th, the week of March 9th, where the university basically shut down? Uh, because that was one of the, 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 on the, if you look at the red zone, that is an option of basically taking out the lifeboats. My second question is, um, everyone in town has Tony Marulis' phone number, but that doesn't do us any good anymore for UMass. So who is the new, who's the new Tony Marulis? So um, I, I, Nancy's smiling. <laughs> no further notice, Nancy's both Tony Marulis and Nancy Buffon. So good luck, Nancy. And, and many people have my cell phone, but happy to give it to anybody else as well. Yeah. Um, I, I, uh, Steve, I, I don't, I, I, it, it, I, I'm saying Steve Schreiber, but then Steve Goodwin, you're going to jump into, I hope. But I don't think we want to, I, I don't think we can actually say at what specific point a decision might be made in any given uh, uh, scenario because there's so many different factors and so much context. But what I can say is that uh, so long as we have uh, what we believe to be sufficient uh, quarantine and isolation facilities, uh, sufficient uh, uh, measures in place to protect our community and to protect our students and that we can continue to manage this situation, that we will proceed. Uh, Steve, do you want to, Steve Goodwin, do you want to add? Yeah, I, I would just add that all of the state guidance as well as the federal guidance strongly encourages us to do everything we possibly can to be able to maintain the students on the campus to be able to tamp down this outbreak through the kind of measures that we've been discussing today. Of course, the great fear is that you take a population of students that has some level of infection in it and you send them all home. Now you're just taking a problem that's in one place and you're spreading it out to many places. So. Um, there, John's right. We don't have a, a, we're not at a point where we could say that, um, um, that okay, if we hit this particular um, threshold, that, that we would make that decision. But if we don't see the cases start to come down as we anticipate they will, based on all the actions we're taking, we're going to have to take a very serious look at it. Kathy Shane. Uh, thank you. Um, I think I also have two questions. My my first is around your 14 days. We're in the high risk zone of sequestering. How do you re, how do you enforce that? And it says no more than two times out during the week, but it says to get food or to get tests. It could be six times if they go out for each of these things. Because the observation that I'm getting from constituents is lots of people on the street without masks, lots of people in the big Y um, clustering near each other in um, aisles in the store, uh, you know, so not, not social distancing. So how do you enforce, you're not supposed to be doing that and you're supposed to be staying home. And then I guess I wanna build on Steve's. The second question was, if we see that, who do we call? How do we raise an alert? How do we, tell you, you said you're investigating a fraternity, which is a particular place. Are we supposed to say, here's a picture of the two people who were doing this? You know, exactly how do we, how do we, um, without being inhospitable, uh, say, please don't do this and have the university enforce what it says is a contract with the students? So, I mean, um, Evelyn may want to get in on this as well. But I think, you know, the first step for us is to set clear expectations for the students. Um, we know that, you know, there's, uh, you know, imperfect enforcement mechanism for any kind of policy that we have. But our first and in, in intentional effort was to set very clear expectations for the students. And it isn't to say they're only allowed out twice a week. It's the, they're allowed to go out for their twice a week testing and to you know, get food or, or receive medical treatment or other extenuating uh, circumstances. You know? um, but, but so that's the first step, very clear expectations of what, and then to communicate to students that there are indeed consequences, which, which we have done. And those consequences could include suspension, removal from the university, et cetera. And in fact, I think it was on Friday, our student affairs folks sent a note out to students that basically laid out the numbers of students who have actually been sent into discipline. And then in terms of uh, you know, enforcement, 
there's no question we have a lot more mechanisms with the on-campus group than the off-campus group. The challenge for us, and I'm just gonna be honest with you, the challenge for us is for off-campus, it's, you know, it's very hard for us to police and engage in enforcement based on anecdote. Um, so the extent that we can get the most specific information from folks who are observing um, you know, student behavioral issues and, and, and um, you know, in, in evidence that we can act upon and then um, engage in an investigation is the best way that we can go. And I know that Sally Lenowski follows up if we find out that an address has been um, suspect of having a gathering. Sally will go out there with, uh, and, and knock on a door. I know that Student Affairs is following up. So um, uh, from that end of things, um, uh, maybe Evelyn, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah. So if if we receive, like John was saying, if we receive information where we can actually act on it, we are happy happy to do that. Um, it is hard when we receive information that is a picture or without names of the students that are involved. Um, it makes it very hard for us to be able to then follow up with those students to let them know what our expectations are. But when we do have that information, we do follow up to make sure that those students know what our expectations are. And then if necessary for us to be able to take the appropriate actions to um, sanction them appropriately based on their violation. And, and I know that Sally and her team do interventions in town as well. Um, Sally, do you wanna add anything from your perspective? Sure, yeah, if we get a, um, you know, a complaint that comes into even to the COVID concern line um, and the property is named and specifically what the behavior is. Um, if there's a police response that generally goes through um, student conduct and community standards, but sometimes it's just we observe something it's con it's concerning to us. Um, so we'll reach out to those individuals. Um, sometimes it is a knock a knock and talk, um, but we will generally respond to things um and have a conversation with those students um as soon as as we can to try to you know sort of nip things in the bud and then in terms of when we do our neighborhood strolls um those are very much about you know sort of reinforcing the messaging um we bring a um pretty diverse group out on those walks of ages and we've had some things i know mandy joe did one with us on halloween and and uh, and mindy and you know, going out and showing that this is a unified front, that we're all in this together, um, and that we all have a vested interest in keeping each other healthy and healthy and safe. We're going to wrap it up, but we have two more sets of questions. Shalini Balmil? Yeah, just a quick shout out first to all the students and the staff at UMass and our town staff that has been working. So, you know, with such grace and in this time period, so just wanted to say that. And I had a question for Senator Joe Comerford and State Rep Mindy Dome uh, regarding vaccinations priorities. Is there anything that can be done to prioritize um, vaccinations for teachers K through 12 and our professors given the mental health and so many other aspects of well-being that are that's putting so much pressure on our students and kids and uh, yeah, is there anything that can be done to prioritize that? Please go ahead, Senator. Um, Rep. Dom, do you want to go or shall I kick off? You can kick off, Senator. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you so much for that question. I just will add my thanks to everyone for your work in this really, truly difficult time. Um, to answer your question specifically about vaccines, um, as you know, the command center, uh, which is you know run by the Baker administration, has with the vaccine advisory committee rolled um, out this three phase vaccine plan which has been executed upon until the moment when uh, governor baker intervened and um, lifted the prioritization of 65 and above um, over it, in this cohort um, over the essential workforce so right under uh, 75 and above um, I, i'll speak only for myself but i know that rep dom has done this that we have made the case to the Baker administration, um, to the secretary, both about um, UMass faculty, and I know UMass faculty um, and UMass administration has also spoken to, especially front-facing faculty in classes um, as needing prioritization, and also, of course, K-12 and early childcare, frankly, 
um, all needing prioritization in this essential worker cohort. Um, so we've made those cases repeatedly. Um, we believe uh, in this essential workforce as needing prioritization. Um, I'm glad like everybody else that the 75 and above uh, folks are getting um, prioritization. I'm glad that we'll see folks with two comorbidities uh, getting prioritization. Um, and now my focus really has been on the kind of scale we need in Western Massachusetts and the regional equitable um, way in which the outlets are dispersed through especially Hampshire and Franklin County. So the, the number of vaccines and the places they get out um, and really making sure that we have equity along with Repdom, of course, um, we have equity in that both the number of vaccines and where folks go to get them and that the places where folks go to get them are gonna meet the unique challenges and opportunities of our region. Um, so places like UMass, which can open up to numerous um, people. And then of course, places like Amherst Public Health that can go the distance and it's perhaps hard to reach cohorts um, and every kind of distribution outlet in between. Thank you so much, Representative Dunn. Um, Thank you so much. And again, thank you to everybody for putting this on for our community and for being available to answer questions. Um, like Senator Comerford, I've also sent um, a letter to the governor um, urging him to reprioritize public facing essential workers. I was not happy with their demotion. Um, and that includes childcare workers, teachers, grocery workers, food pantry workers, and bus drivers, as um, others. Um, and we're continuing to press on that. I do not think that the that he will reprioritize them back. I, I mean, we'll continue to advocate for that, but he has not indicated a willingness um, to understand that public facing essential workers need our support in the vaccination plan. I'm also focusing on vaccine equity, both regional equity as well as equity through communities in the state. Last week, um, we, introduced, we filed, along with um, another representative, two senators, and Senator Comerford's consultation, a bill around vaccine equity that really sort of increases the ways in which the state can meet the need for the hardest hit communities and the most vulnerable individuals. And I think the hope with that legislation is that it like gives a big nudge to the administration to start um, initiating the activities that are gonna be required for us to make sure that we reach vaccine equity, both regionally, as well as throughout um, the populations and communities in the Commonwealth. Um, but I'm sorry to say, Councillor, that I don't think he's going to reprioritize essential workers. I, I'm sorry to say that. I mentioned that later on in our agenda, we have a um, resolution uh, on this very issue. Uh, and on the school committee agenda tomorrow night, there's a parallel resolution. So you'll be hearing from us. I will, I will be delighted to uh, echo that. With That's the, great. It, it's important for us to, to take Amherst call directly into the state house and the governor. Uh, Alyssa, you have your hand up and that's the last question we're gonna take. Yes, I had cut myself back, back to one question, except for the fact that I just appreciated that we brought Representative Dom and Senator Comerford into this because I wanted to thank them for all the work they did to advocate to the governor about what a disaster the 75 plus rollout originally was. And thanks to them and lots of other people working with them, they've made much improvements over a quite short period of time. So thank you for that. That made a huge difference in a lot of people's stress level and got things going in a much better direction. The only question I wanted to make sure I asked UMass, because I wasn't clear if this was covered earlier, is we've had several constituents ask us why it is that UMass used to publish details of symptomatic and asymptomatic testing. I think people kind of got geeked out about that information. We're excited to see how many people, you know, that many of the tests were asymptomatic. It was just that UMass was catching them because they were doing so much testing. And they wondered why that information had been removed from the dashboard. And so I wondered if you could just let us know if, you know, the obvious answer is because it was labor intensive and we didn't find it productive, but I don't know if that's the actual real answer. That's certainly the first half of the real answer, Alyssa, is that it was extremely labor intensive. What we're trying to do now is to look at the dashboard to see if we can um, restructure it a little bit so people can follow the kind of 
information they'd like to get in terms of breakdowns of what kind of students or whether they're on campus, off campus, um, other details about that without having to do every single one as a separate little paragraph bio. That was fairly easy in the beginning, but it has become almost impossible and we're much better off putting that time into actually calling people and doing the contact tracing than writing the bios. And I'll just add to, to Steve's point, you know, as, as the Commonwealth has kind of revised their dashboard and do different things, kind of we're kind of in version 2.0 or 3.02 um, as part of it from adding active cases to QI to the seven day positivity. But, but I would say, you know, I mean, if, if there's different things that, you know, the public is looking for, you know, we're happy to take it under consideration to kind of put it out there from that perspective. Obviously, we, we don't have, can't produce every detail that the Commonwealth does and, and all of their, um, and, the, and the dashboard. But, you know, we have our epidemiologist team that, you know, we live off of this data every day and we have breakdowns of certain things. So, you know, if there's different ideas and thoughts that people have with, with the data, you know what I mean? We're, we're happy to take it under consideration to put, to put it on the public dashboard. Thank you. I wanna thank UMass and our team from the town for joining us tonight. It was coincidental that we had set this up at a, such a critical time in our town's health. And uh, we really appreciate all the information. I wanna also say, that for people who are in the audience and would like to advance additional questions, please do so. We will collect them. We will get them to UMass or to the town uh, as well and make sure that they are answered for you and perhaps we can figure out a way to post those as well. So we are going to go on to the next part of our agenda. I would like to see if Emma and Tim and Anne might stick around because there may be a comment or two during the public comment. Okay, but the rest of you are also welcome to stay. Again, thank you. So the next item on our agenda is hearings and we have none. And the item after that is general public comment. This will be the only public comment tonight. And I wanna just uh, I'm sorry, Mary Beth, Paul. <laughs> um, I want to just state that residents are welcome to express their views. I'm going to find out how many residents would like to speak before I put a time limit on it. Uh, the council will not engage in a dialogue or comment on a matter raised during general public comment. So could I see a show of hands for those people who would like to make public comment? All right, Amy Zuckerman, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Um, Amy Zuckerman, 93 Plum Tree Road in Sunderland. Thank you, Lynn and everyone else in this well-informed meeting. There's one question that's very serious. Many of us have already had our first shots at UMass. If the campus shuts down and goes into total lockdown like in March, will the vaccine center stay open? I have to tell you that's a question that will have to be answered in the future, but my guess is yes. Okay, those of us who are get, have appointments, please let us know, it's very difficult. Thank you very much, appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, Felicity Mednick. Please state your name and where you live. You need to unmute. Ah, thank you. Okay. So I'm Felicia Mednick from 137 State Street in Amherst. And I want to talk about the proposed um, biomass resolution that's coming up in this meeting, presented by the League of Women Voters. Um, I just want to say, first of all, that the state has some very, very strong, wonderful um, stringent regulations around how biomass can be counted as renewable energy. They're very good. Right now, the Baker administration is trying to change those regulations in a way that will benefit the biomass plant in Springfield. 
the plant in Springfield will not be built unless those regulations are weakened. Fortunately, the administration is also moved by local opposition, as we saw when they quest had um, hearings at here two years ago and stopped trying to change regulations. And that's why I think it's important for the Amherst Town Council to pass a resolution in opposition to biomass. What I want to particularly emphasize is that the biomass resolution is only directed towards biomass use in large scale power plants. It has no bearing on heating facilities like Cooley Dickinson Hospital or other businesses or households that might be heated with wood. Contrarily, the proposed biomass plant in Springfield is a large scale biomass plant. And that's where we'll have those well-known adverse environmental and health effects that will spread through the valley in the world. That's what I wanted to say. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Um, Ian Roadwalt, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Uh, hello, I am Ian Roadwalt. I live on Pine Street in Amherst. Um, and I came to talk about the problem that UMass has presented us with. Um, buildings on campus are being maintained by skeleton crews because the maintainers and maintenance tech workers have been furloughed, despite UMass having more than enough money to bring them back, both with CARES Act money and their endowment and uh, the amount of students they have enrolled. Students have been uh, quarantined in condemned buildings, uh, according to a recent Boston Globe article. Um, and despite what the UMass PR person just said, uh, the fraternities have had back-to-back uh, -back parties this past weekend um, with no social distancing and very little masks, according to this Daily uh, Collegian article. Um, as of the beginning of last week, at least 100 or so graduate workers uh, were told to teach face-to-face, -face, despite not being given health and safety, unnecessary health and safety information after numerous requests. This whole situation was completely preventable. UMass is a neighbor in our community. Right now, UMass is being reckless and negligent with our community, with their students, and with those, those of us in the community who work at UMass. And when confronted with these issues by members of the town community and the unions who work on campus, UMass has offered platitudes and um, forgive this expression, but PR turd polishing. UMass knows what it is doing. They knew what would happen and to say otherwise is ridiculous. Um, they should never have reopened with this, this amount of students. And uh, I'll leave it at that and yield the rest of my time. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Isolda, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Good evening, this is Isolde Artero Samante. I live in South Amherst, District 5. Thank you so much uh, to Representative Dom in particular and Senator Conifor for everything they've done and, and all of you for tonight. Uh, my question for the UMass officials has to do with a very specific group of workers who are the dining and custodial uh, workers on the campus. Um, some of whom are um, workers uh, originally of immigrant background who live locally in Amherst. This spring, uh, we saw that there were um, unmet needs and, um, and the town and the hospital tried to provide for those. Um, and it really concerned us that people were taking buses um, while they had symptoms. The issue um, is partially, but not totally resolved because even though workers may have access to testing. If they become ill, their family members do not have access to the testing. And so I want my very specific question uh, to you, Mass officials, is, uh, is there an understanding of the very specific conditions of the custodial and or dining workers, uh, particularly local ones, uh, from language minority communities who need assistance with testing and or um, conditions that they face when they quarantine for a very specific examples. There are um, multiple children in an apartment uh, in a high density apartment building in District 5. 
uh, where we had uh, several cases um, were, did not necessarily have access to testing and, and uh, not necessarily allowed to return to employment until they could guarantee that everyone in their household was negative. So um, I just wanted to hear about um, some any plans uh, for those very specific populations. Thank you very much. Thank you. And please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Ann Lardner, 175 Amity Street. Quick question for the town of from the public health department. Is, the, is there any arrangements for people who are severely physically disabled and shut in to get the COVID vaccine? Are some arrangements being made for that? That's my question. Thank you. Okay. That ends public comment, but since Emma is with us still, Emma, is there any information you might provide regarding the shut-in and vaccinations? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I know that's a very complex um, demographic and, and population that certainly we want to see served. Uh, I know that myself, um, Mary Beth Ogalevitz and Chief Nelson, we have a team that are trying to identify those individuals in our community and problem solve with other agencies to try and be able to meet their needs. But we are thinking about th those individuals um, so we can strategize around them so that way they will be, be able to get the vaccine. But we are also looking forward to guidance from the State Department of Public Health, um, maybe partnering with uh, private pharmacies as well. But this is a, a complicated issue because of certainly the um, fragility of the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines right now and the time constraints that we have from when we have when we are able to take them out of the freezer or refrigerator and then when we have by the time we have to administer them. But we are thinking about this. We're trying to problem solve around it and we thank this. Thank you for this question. Thank you. We're going to go on to the rest of our agenda and Emma and Jim, everyone, thank you for joining us tonight. Um, the consent agenda is long. We're going to put it up on the screen. Um, it includes the following. Let me just say, remember, I'd like to just remind the council that items are placed on consent agenda because they are considered to be routine and it was reasonable to expect they would pass with no controversy. To remove an item from the consent agenda for discussion later in the meeting, ask that it be removed when I list the consent, the consent agenda item. To request a removal does not require a second. The motion is as follow and I'll be looking for a second. To move the following items and the printed mo motions there under and approve those items as a single unit. Suspension of town council rules of procedure 8.4. Hold up and then it turns tight. When Thank you. Um, for the following agenda items. 8B, authorization of council president to sign letter to community safety working group. And 8.D, approval of extension of temporary appointment of town clerk. I just want to remind you that all that does is allow us to act tonight. It does not approve those items. 6A, adoption of the resolution opposing the Palmer Springfield biomass power plant. 6D, adoption of the Lunar New Year Spring Festival Celebration Proclamation. 8D, approval of extension of temporary appointment of town clerk. 8F, withdrawal of measures measure pursuant to council rules of procedure 8.8, .8, proposed prohibition on the municipal use of face recognition technology bylaw. 9A, one to three, approval of town manager appointments. Affordable Housing Trust, Board of Trustees, Licensed Commissioners, Public Shade Tree Committee. 11 A to D, approval of minutes, January 4th, 2021, Special Town Council meeting, January 4th, 2021, Town Council Public Forum, January 4th, regular Town Council meeting. Is there a second? Second, Ross. Thank you. Please uh, take the screen down. And 
George, you have your hand up. Yes, I'd like 6A, a, bi a biomass resolution removed. Okay. Are there any other requests? All right, uh, then the motion's been made and seconded. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, I will begin to ask if you approve of the motion. Um, Alyssa Brewer. Aye. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Darcy DeMont. Yes. Lisa Merzen, aye. Mandy Jo Haneke. Aye. Pam. Aye. Mindy Ross. Uh, <laughs> Evan Ross. Aye. Sorry. George Ryan. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. Steve Schreiber. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Sarah Schwartz. Aye. Uh, Shalini Balmilm. Yes. Votes 13000. Uh, we're moving on to the next item. Uh, and in fact, we now are going to bring the re resolution opposing the Palmer Spring Biomass Power Plant resolution. George, you were the one that asked this be removed. Would you speak to your reasons? Yeah, Lynn, I, I just had a question about, uh, and this is just ignorance on my part, and I apologize to everyone, but um, does this apply to the Cooley Dickinson heating system, um, this kind of resolution? Um, I, I've heard two different things tonight, or I've actually read one thing and heard something else. Uh, I don't know if anyone knows the answer to that, but if they do, um, I'd, I'd like to know. Hi, Darcy. Yeah, I'm wondering if we could uh, bring in the League of Women Voters um, sponsor for this um, so that they could uh, speak to that. And I, I can also speak to it, but I think it would be a good thing to bring in Martha Hanner if she's here. Thank you. She is. And uh, Fina, would you please bring Martha Hanner in? Good evening. Yes. Yes. Good evening. Thank you for letting me speak. I do want to emphasize that this resolution focuses specifically on the large scale wood burning power plants with their notoriously low efficiency and high pollution. And subsidies for such large wood burning power plants are regulated by the Department of Energy's Renewable Energy Portfolio Standards, which are now poised for revision. However, the use of woody biomass residues for heating on a smaller scale in modern stoves and furnaces with their higher efficiency, or the cases such as the Cooley Dickinson uh, plant, which is cogeneration, it's heating, and uh, then some also some uh, power generation, those are covered under the Department of Energy's alternate portfolio standards which is a separate category and it's a clear distinction. So it's not at all relevant uh, to this resolution. If you read the resolution at each one of the be it resolves, it specifically states the large scale wood burning power plants. Uh, and so it's not relevant uh, to, the, to the heating case. Thank you, Martha. George, was there any further question on that? No, Martha, thank you very much. Okay. Uh, any further questions on this particular resolution? I also want to note that Martha is the resident sponsor, but then we have Dorothy Pam and Darcy Dumont as the councilor sponsors on this one. Uh, and Martha has provided with additional material that is in your packet. Are there any further questions? Okay, seeing none, I'm going to move to... Darcy has a hand up. I'm sorry. I have my hand up. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't see it oh, it's because I'm in the wrong column. I'm sorry. Darcy, please go ahead. I just have a quick comment. I just wanted to uh, remind counselors that this is sponsored by the League of Women Voters. It's very much supported by our local Mothers Out Front group. It's endorsed by the Energy and Climate Action Committee. Um, and it really goes to support our 
neighbors in the Pioneer Valley that are that are really are our environmental justice community of the Pioneer Valley, um, meaning the low income community most likely to be affected by climate and environmental impacts such as air pollution. Um, and uh, as the league mentioned, uh, Springfield is actually the asthma capital of the entire United States. So um, that's a big reason why this particular plant should be opposed. I, when I was teaching in Holyoke, I, I, saw, I saw this every day. I saw kids with inhalers absences because of trips to the ER because due to asthma. Um, so anyway, I strongly urge the council to um, show support for this resolution. Thank you for your comments, Darcy. Is there any other comments at this time? Okay, if not, then I'm moving to the vote. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Darcy. Sorry, we don't, we, we need a motion first. I'm sorry, you're absolutely correct. The motion is to adopt the resolution opposing the Palmer Springfield biomass power plant as presented. Is there a second? Second, DeAngelis. Okay, thank you. Uh, now, now we will move to the vote. Aye. Darcy, <laughs> Darcy Dumont. Aye. Lynn, aye. <clears throat> Haneke. Aye. Dorothy Pam. Aye. Evan Ross. Aye. George Ryan. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. Steve Schreiber. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Sarah Schwartz. Aye. Kelly Balmill. Yes. Alyssa Brewer. Aye. Thank you. Passes 13000. Uh, we have done the Lunar New Year. We are going on to a presentation. From the Energy and Climate Action Committee, they have submitted their annual report. And I believe we are joined tonight by uh, Andra Rose, Vice Chair, and Ashwin Rav Kumar, who is also on the committee, Laura Drucker has also been able to join us and she is the chair of this committee. And I just wanna mention there may be others in the audience, uh, Dwayne Breger, uh, Jesse Selman, Sarah Durr, and Stephen Roof and Darcy Dumont um, from the council and Sarah Schwartz from the council are also on this committee. And the sustainability coordinator is Stephanie Ciccarella. So please proceed with the presentation. Hello, I'm... Andra Rose, are we going to be visual, um, visible? It's no? on the screen. And all you need to do is advance, say advance the slide. Okay, but our, we, we will not have our faces visual. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah, the faces will be vis visible after the presentation. Um, well, actually, it's now. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, I'm Andrew Rose. I'm vice chair of the um, Energy and Climate Action Committee. And um, I'm joined with by Professor Ashwin uh, Ravi Kumar, who uh, from Amherst College, who will be starting us off on the next slide. All right. Good evening, everybody. Um, you can advance the slide. Yeah, that's perfect. Thanks so much for having us. Um, um, it's an exciting moment for climate policy in this country and also in Amherst. Um, after four years of stagnation under Donald Trump, the Biden administration has provided those of us concerned with climate change with a really critical breath of fresh air. Um, and here in Amherst, we have big opportunities and a big responsibility to move forward with the momentum at the federal level to meet our ambitious targets. And to remind you of what those targets are, it is to reduce our emissions by 25% by 2025, and 50% by 2030. So really big, bold commitments from Amherst that we have to act boldly to meet. Um, I suggest reading Biden's executive orders if you get the chance. 
get the chance, but just a couple of highlights that really resonate with the main findings of our work that we'll talk about today. Um, first, the Biden administration committed 40% of federal climate investments to frontline and especially black and indigenous communities. This is a really key victory for the climate justice movement, and it resonates strongly with the decision that was just taken around the biomass plant. And we heard from our community that this is really important to residents here. Next slide, please. And the second thing that the Biden administration did was call for all federal agencies to center climate change in their planning. Up here on this slide, you see an org chart of Amherst, uh, the town of Amherst, why? Well, because we, the Energy and Climate Action Committee are just one committee thinking about this, but our work has really shown us that all committees and agencies in the town government need to come up with concrete steps to center climate change in their planning, to think about how, how climate change impacts their work and how their work impacts climate change, and think about how they can move forward um, and staff appropriately all of these processes, echoing really what the Biden administration has done at the federal level. We are just one committee. Stephanie Siccarello, who has been amazing, is just one person as sustainability coordinator. Um, but what we need is uh, more resources and commitment to this work going forward. Uh, next slide, please. So this is a bit of context about our emissions portfolio. We're going to skip this right now for the in the interest of time. So next slide, please. And I will pass it off to Andra to talk about our work so far. Un unmute, Andra. Thank you. We, we can come back to that slide um, uh, if people are interested. Um, so um, the uh, community choice aggregation with Pelham and Northampton is moving forward. Um, we'll, this will help us a lot with um, making big cuts to our electricity emissions over time. And to su succeed, we'll need sustained engagement from a broad coalition of constituents. Um, and that's something that the committee sees as part of our work uh, to, to engage these constituencies. Thank you. Uh, next slide. So new charging stations have been installed in town. Convenient charging for uh, electric vehicles is one tactic to help us reduce our transportation emissions that we'll be needing to um, do more of. Next slide. So, thank you. The solar array on the landfill has made it past the permitting hurdle and um, is closer to beginning construction now. Next slide, please. So the town partnered with the farmer's market to bring local fresh grown food to low income residents and to support sustainable farming. Next slide, please. Back to. All right, yeah, thanks uh, for those updates, Andra. A lot of really exciting stuff. Um, so in the Energy and Climate Action Committee, thanks to a grant that Stephanie Siccarello got from MVP um, at the state level, we were able to uh, invest a lot in outreach and equity and inclusion. We hired Gazet Kaya Nikosi to um, reach out to Black, Indigenous, low-income renter communities and identify community leaders to really bring them into our process. And we were able to put funding into translation, food, and even childcare. And being able to do that, that was absolutely critical to our work. Um, it was a really positive experience. And we hope that the town can try to incorporate those best practices across its work as it continues to push for the big climate and agenda that we have. Uh, next slide. And I wanna talk just quickly about some of the concrete recommendations that came out of this outreach process around the budget. Um, so really quickly, it's important to first of all note that when it comes to climate change, we often make short-term capital expenses, expenditures, in order to generate long-term operational savings. And we hope that the town will find ways to think holistically about these currently different segments of the budget because climate change is the type of challenge that requires it. You can read more about that uh, in our uh, report. Next slide, please. So fundamentally, um, a budget is more than a simple allocation of resources. Um, as Martin Luther King put it over half a century ago, a budget is fundamentally a moral document, one that demonstrates a community's priorities 
and who concern, whose concerns it centers in decision making. So a couple things that came out of our work um, is that uh, people had real big ideas about what they'd like to see from the town. People pointed out that they'd like opportunities as renters to connect with energy efficiency and renewable energy programs. That's a great thing that the town can support and ought to staff from what we heard. Um, other community members and especially youth organizers suggested shifting resources away from policing and into sustainability. Um, they pointed out that right now we have 36 cops and one sustainability coordinator. Um, and personally, I think that if we ask, is that a good expression of our moral commitments, given that we say that we value both climate justice and racial justice? To me, it sounds like no. So that's something that we really need to think about. Um, we also uh, got requests for farm from farmers to provide opportunities to sequester carbon in their soils and from community leaders to involve BIPOC youth in growing food, um, to find ways to include low income community members in the governance of community choice aggregation, which is gonna be a major part of how we reduce electricity emissions is also gonna be super important. So these are some great suggestions from our community members that we hope the town can move forward with. Next slide. Uh, I'll pass it to Andra to wrap it up now. Yeah. Okay, so um, we have very specific uh, recommendations for the capital budget, and that's to support the solar siting study on school parking lots, which was proposed in a resident capital request from myself and ARHS students. For the operating budget, our immediate concern is the need for an intern for Stephanie. Her tasks have already multiplied. It's going to get much worse. Um, there will be a tremendous amount of work involved in coordinating the town departments to integrate climate goals into their the work that is already on um, everybody's plate in a deep, a deep way. Um, and we believe this requires a sustainability department with several staff members, which we lay out in the annual report. Next slide, please. So um, the plan will, the, the climate action adaptation and resilience plan that we've been working with uh, consultants on for the last, um, uh, since the summer, um, will focus on the next five years with a particular uh, amount of detail on the actions we might take in the first year. We're starting to prioritize 82 actions that we've generated through outreach and through research into other municipal plans. And we welcome your, uh, our counselors input now to help us make this plan meaningful and implementable. Um, now is a good time because the plan will be completed and coming to you in May, which is a busy time for you. So please let us know how we can support you in making decisions about the first year of actions at that time. Um, and thank you so much for allowing us to present in person. And Ashwin, I and Stephanie are available to answer questions now. Thank you. Could you please take the slides? Thank you. Uh, Pat DeAngelis, you have your hand up. We also need the clock, Athena. Yeah, sorry. I, I want to thank the committee, the ECAC, because your outreach to the community was exemplary, particularly to the BIPOC community. And it teaches us something and teaches all committees something about the use of interpretation in sign language, interpretation in Spanish and other languages, and providing child care and stipends wherever appropriate. I, and so I, I don't have a question. Um, I just want to thank you for that. But I do want to make a small correction to something Andra said. The mobile market um, was initiated by Healthy Hampshire, which is part of the Collaborative for Educational Services. And I'm a member of the group that has now become the mobile market. It has nothing to do with the farmer's market. Completely separate entity and an incredible organization that is really powered by the people who have the need. Um, yeah, so anyway, thank you both. Thank you. And will we start the clock? Ah, Darcy Dumont? Yeah, I just wanted to um, uh, thank Andra and Ashwin for this great update and just make a brief comment that 
um, in this era of the new normal, um, we do need to be constantly thinking about how we can reprioritize our spending um, to meet the changing needs of our community, to be climate resilient, and to reduce our emissions. So I also want to give kudos to the Finance Committee um, for uh, recognizing that in their, in their guidance document um, about the upcoming need for flexibility. Thank you. Evan Ross. Yeah, um, nice to see you all again. It's been a while. Um, and thank, I want to also thank you for the, uh, not just the presentation, but also the written report, which I thought was thorough. Um, and I'm glad I was had, had a chance to read it for this meeting. Uh, I had I had two questions. Um, one was both the report and the presentation mentioned um, connecting renters with opportunities for energy efficiency and renewable energy. Um, and I, I wasn't quite sure I understood what that meant or what you were envisioning with that. So I was just wondering if it was possible to elaborate a little bit on that. Um, and then the second thing I, I wanted to ask is I know um, when I departed the committee, there had been some conversations about um, ways to electrify the municipal fleet. And I know there were some initial conversations with starting with the police department, um, since those are cars that are used constantly in turnover. Um, and I didn't see that in the report or the presentation. And so I was wondering if that was an ongoing conversation or if that had been temporarily shelved for some of these other priorities. So thank you. I'll answer the second one first. That was, from what I understand, temporarily shelved. We hope temporarily um, due to budget constraints. Um, and uh, the, the first about renters, um, it's been very difficult, you may know, uh, for renters to access um, clean energy themselves. Um, if you're low income and um, you don't, have a large enough bill because you're on um, <clears throat> fuel assistance, you, you may not have enough to even be able to enroll in what's called community solar. Um, the, um, the CCA will allow for everyone to increase their um, amount of renewable energy just because we will be able to get a default level higher than the utilities amount of renewable energy. So that'll be fair across the board. Um, and there are some other ways that we can increase access to energy services um, like energy efficiency um, for renters and for everybody. Yeah, and I, I would just add that another kind of barrier that a lot of renters face to accessing uh, programs that utilities offer around renewables um, is that it's just kind of complicated. It's confusing and people don't have a lot of time. So what the town could do is provide staffing, provide uh, resources um, to really go through systematically and make sure that renters are aware of how to access renewable energy programs and credits um, and that they know how to navigate that. Um, this is something that other towns have done and we can find examples of what that could look like. Um, but um, to do that at the town level is great. There's nonprofits that are doing this work um, to some extent, um, but people really had a desire for more and more consistent coverage with respect to that kind of liaising. Great, thank you. Uh, Andy Steinberg. Yeah, hi. Um, I want to thank the committee also for the work that is done and just zero in quickly on two things done in the time limit. One is to follow up on the comments that were just made, but to twisted a little bit. Uh, when I look at what Northampton's done across the river and when I look at our own community and what the um, probable place where the largest number of uh, dwelling units are that um, may not be as energy efficient as they can be, it would seem that we would be talking about um, a real focus on single owner occupied homes or very small units. A lot of renters are in larger units where it is, uh, if you're in an apartment complex, you don't really control anything other than e e um, what your choice is on a very small electric bill. So um, it struck me that there was so little about um, what I think is uh, likely to be the place where the largest 
gain can be made because of the amount of units and the amount of probable waste that is happening within the way many of our homes in this community are being run. The other subject is the budget. Um, and as chair of the finance committee, uh, I just want to note that uh, we're really very far along in the FY22 process. And at this point, um, the budget is being developed by the town manager and uh, then we'll come back to the council with has a very specific role um, that reacts to the um, what 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 is will be proposed on May first by the town manager. Um, the guidance that we gave, as uh, uh, was alluded to by uh, uh, council councilor Demont, is that uh, we pointed out that uh, the performance objectives and goals for the town manager um, have financial, uh, require financial investments. Um, but um, I also have to note that um, we are in a very difficult financial time and the goals for the town manager include not just climate action, but also community health and safety, economic vitality, four major capital investments, housing affordability, and racial equity and social justice. So that um, when the town manager is looking at what he can do with a very difficult budget in, a, uh, in the year that we're in, he's got a tough task. Thank you for your comments, Sandy. Uh, Mandy Jo. Yeah, thank you. And thank you for your work and for the annual report. I, I wanted to, um, I, I don't know whether there's a question in here. There is in some sense a question in this. In your report, um, you talked about using the use of a climate lens in purchasing and building operations or buildings along with showing a commitment to climate goals by decarbonizing buildings. And so, you know, we already have a net zero bylaw, but that obviously does not apply to all buildings because it's to new buildings only. And we have a number of projects coming up, but also potentially when, you know, a, a heating system fails or something, or, you know, how are we going to be getting guidance on when we're repairing major systems in town funds or various proposals, some of which include a repair that would continue using fossil fuels and others for the same building that would say, eliminate the use of fossil fuels. Will we be getting guidance from ECAC on how to evaluate those potential, um, you know, plans as it relates to climate action goals and climate action lenses? Um, I'll, I'll just answer quickly that um, we should talk. Um, that, that is one of the things that we've talked about is, you know, procurement decisions, planning ahead um, for those kinds of large expenditures, but also smaller ones, and how we can be a resource for town departments in making those decisions. Ashwin, did you have anything to add? Uh, yeah, no, I would just say absolutely. I mean, I feel like when we talk about trying to make sure that climate change is considered in all municipal government agencies and all aspects of municipal governance, that's the kind of thing we're talking about. And I think that ECAC would be um, a great starting point, at least, to try to think about how to come up with a system to make those considerations appropriately. I just want to recognize that Laura Drucker is also in the panelist area. And Laura, if you want to add, please let us know, OK? Uh, Kathy Shane. Thank you. Um, I have uh, one is a question of Andra and Ashwin, and the other is uh, a question more directed to Paul. Um, so I'll ask first the one of Andra. Um, on when we talk about low income and it's more difficult to figure out if, especially a low income who happens to be a homeowner and wants to do something to, to lower energy use, um, is it possible? Um, and we're followed later with a Community Preservation Act presentation. So we'll have someone else who's now on. Could, um, if, if the family that's in those houses meets the income threshold, could CPA money 
be used if we had contractors who could come, an example is a neighbor's house, by putting siding on and doing different window instead of single pane windows, double pane and tighter, they dramatically increase the warmth of the house and decrease the energy. Can CP, can we tap into CPA money or is there housing money statewide? So that's that question. And I'll just ask my second one. Um, the solar panel study for uh, parking lots at the schools was presented to JCPC as a resident request. And I had a, we have a set aside money of a capital reserve that as far as I know, we haven't been tapping into. And Paul, when I had a conversation with you, you said for the small, the size of the request, we might be able to take some appropriated already money and repurpose it to meet this. And it's a question of, could we, do we have plans? Could we have plans to get that done sooner rather than waiting for next year? And my question is because the administration at the federal level has changed and we may well see opportunities if we're ready to tap into federal or state money. So if we had a study done on what we could install and having just looked at the school's operating budgets, those would come back to Amherst, even if we just say um, our current share of the budget and operating budget savings would more than offset the costs for this initial study. So I'm just wondering if we can't move faster on that since it was a relatively small amount of money rather than waiting for another year. So it's a first to Andra and then to Paul. Um, so if, I, I can um, tell you a little bit about um, energy efficiency services that are available for um, both uh, renters and um, owners who are low income. There are significant um, incentives um, to 100% um, of, of um, the costs being uh, covered. Um, the kind of retrofit that you were describing is not a part of the usual program. Uh, um, they'll do blown in insulation. They won't put, um, you know, insulation on the outside and new siding. Um, but there, as he said, there's going to be a lot of changes. There's going to be a lot of um, new options and, and it'd be really great for us to be shovel ready to take advantage of the state and federal money that will be coming through. Well, did you want to sure. So on the first question, sometimes CDBG money has been used for income eligible properties that are owned that can be used for uh, energy retrofits. So that's something we could look into. In terms of the um, solar studies, the, I think you were at Saturday's presentation where the school committee showed the regional school district had set aside some money. We've talked with them about sharing that cost. We're seeking outside funds to support that uh, because there are there is funding available. So we're always looking for outside funds. Um, as you know, most of the parking lots that are most um, attractive are do not are not owned by the town. They're owned by the region, and so it have to be in conjunction with the region. But it's definitely. Um, I, I, what I said to you previously is, is definitely on our radar screen to move that forward sooner than later. Okay, I'm going to take Thank one you. last question, Shalini. Oh, yes. Uh, my question was about the slide that we skipped and uh, looking at the, the emissions coming from residential buildings being a lot and um, transportation being lower and so is there a way for us to get guidance on what where our limited resources could be invested so we get the maximum impact i can and i can try to take that um so, okay. so uh the climate action adaptation and resilience plan the carp that's coming out is going to be doing a lot of the heavy lifting on helping us to okay. prioritize actions as a town taking into account the overall kind of breakdown of our emissions portfolio. Um, so that's the thing to look out for um, to get that additional okay. guidance. Um, I think we're happy to have conversations before then with you to try to help you be equipped to act quickly um, right. and efficiently and to understand that report as it comes in too. Um, but I also just wanna take that opportunity to say, yes, you're absolutely right. Residential buildings um, are a really big share of our emissions portfolio. Um, and to um, 
uh, Councillor Steinberg's comment earlier about um, who rents and who owns and that sort of thing. Um, yes, we absolutely don't uh, mean to suggest that homeowners um, are not a priority. On the contrary, they're a really important priority because there's a, they're a big share of the overall emissions pie in Amherst, right? Um, so mm -hmm. the key thing is to make sure that we are appropriately staffing programs to connect everyone um, who's part of this picture to the programs that they need to be connected to. Mm -hmm. um, and the plan is gonna hopefully um, lay out some really concrete steps um, to move forward most appropriately given all of those realities. Andrew, did you wanna add anything to that? No, did you have a question? Yes, thank you so much. And the other was like, is there a way to work with UMass, of course, and the other colleges? And just given that they have such smart people working there and innovative minds, and so how could we be collaborating to build and create more education and opportunities to, you know, be working together to bring down and work really together? I mean, that is something that is clearly has to be one of our goals. Um, mm -hmm. They're ahead of us and they've set even more ambitious um, mm. goals and are putting money into it. Um, mm. So um, the colleges and the um, university are taking it very seriously. And I'm hoping that we can um, both piggyback on their mm. knowledge. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, that is going to take a lot of coordinating. It's very technical information. Um, we may need, you know, staff to, to be brought up to speed, existing staff, put it into, you know, job descriptions for new hires um, so that we're ready to, to do that kind of multi-stakeholder coordinating. Thank you. In the interest of time, we're, we're going to be seeing this group again in May. Uh, with your uh, recommendation. And uh, we look forward to that. And if there are individual counselors who would like to share ideas, I am sure that Laura and Andra and Ashwin and the rest of the committee would love to hear them. Okay, thank you. Thank you all so much. And I, I, can I just really quickly want to reiterate that last point. We know that the, uh, the CARP, the plan is going to come at you at a really busy time and we want to be there to help you make sense of it and act on it. So please, please take us up on that. Thank you. Okay, uh, we're going to move on to the Community Preservation Act committee recommendations. And uh, while we're teeing that up and making sure that um, proper people are brought into the room, um, let me just mention, this is an automatic referral to the Finance Committee. During the conversation after the presentation, if there are other um, committees that need to see anything or feel they need to uh, see anything, we will have to make that into a motion. Um, and let me just proceed with that by saying thank you, Sarah and uh, Anthony Delaney for being with us tonight. And uh, let's just, oh, and Sonia as well. We're glad to see you. Uh, so Sarah, we're gonna put this, these slides up and proceed, okay? Hey, thank you. There's the chair of the CPAC. Um, yes, good evening, everyone. Happy to be with you on behalf of the Community Preservation Act Committee to present our recommendations for grants in fiscal year 2022. Uh, may I have the next slide, please? Before I get to our recommendations, I want to recognize all the members of the committee. Uh, I am the uh, delegate from uh, appointee from uh, Amherst Recreation. We also have Sam McLeod, Anna Devlin Gothier, Sarah Isinger, Robin Fordham, Andrew McDougall, Diana Stein, David Williams, and Katie Allen Zobel. And we all, they all worked hard and fruitfully under a very compressed schedule this fall. And I want to thank them for their efforts. I also want to thank Anthony Delaney, Holly Bowser and Sonia Aldrich from the finance department for their very able support and advice. Our 
uh, FY22 report recommends to you a total appropriation of $1,659,770. That number does not include any potential new borrowing, but it does include almost $400,000 to pay down previous borrowing for CPA projects. Several of these debts will be retired over the next couple of years, freeing up funds for future projects. In addition, we would like to place $600,000 into reserves for future projects and debt service. A relatively small amount, $25,000, is recommended to offset administrative costs of the program. A new aspect of this expense is design and installation of signs of various types to indicate to the public where CPA funds have been deployed. For example, hanging a Your CPA Dollars at Work banner at new construction projects. We think it is important for the Community Preservation Act program to better publicize to the community how its tax dollars have been used. And we have revitalized our Facebook page, so please, please like us if you're on Facebook. So now I would like to give a brief description of the specific grants we are recommending. May we have the next slide, please? All right, this lists all the, um, all the recommendations uh, I will go through. You will notice there were no open space requests this year. Next slide, please. In the area of community housing, we recommend one proposal, an appropriation of $226,710 for Amherst Community Connections Supportive Housing Project. The goal of this project is to get some of our chronically homeless neighbors into rental housing in Amherst if possible. ACC specifically targets single individuals whose various challenges, medical, employment, or financial, make finding housing particularly difficult. In previous iterations of this effort, most clients have been middle-aged, men, and non-white. None of the funds from CPA go towards the clinical services and social services given to clients to prepare them to qualify for rental housing or to support social service needs while they are tenants. CPA funds will be used to provide rental support for up to six people for up to three years. The maximum value of each rental voucher is $950 per month, which reflects the very high rents in Amherst. Since clients who have income, generally disability benefits, are asked to contribute 25% of their income to the monthly rent, the actual cost of the program may well be reduced. Next slide, please. We are recommending six projects under the historic preservation category. One of these is support for a new home for the Special Collections Department at the Jones Library. And for this project, we recommend a borrowing of $1 million. I know that you will take up the larger Jones Library renovation and expansion project at future meetings, so I won't say very much about this Special Collections aspect now, but want to make two points really for the benefit of the audience. First, this CPA award, if it, is may, if it is approved, is contingent on the larger project receiving the approval of council. If that expansion and renovation project for the Jones Library does not proceed, neither will this special collections project. Secondly, the Jones Library's proposal for special collections was revised based on last year's discussions with the CPA committee to address our concerns about its eligibility for CPA funds, and we are satisfied. So, next slide, please. The second historic preservation project we recommend is a grant of $21,412 to the Goodwin Memorial AME Zion Church for repairs to its roof and chimney. The church is private property, certainly, 
but it is a valuable historical asset and is listed on the National Historic Register. We are confident that this grant advances the public purpose of preserving this historic structure by improving the integrity of the building envelope. Further, this would by no means be the first CPA grant to a local house of worship. More than 10 times this amount was given some years ago to repair the steeple at the JCA's building, for example. And about 10 times this amount was approved for, but not in the end used by, the first congregational church for an interior sprinkler system. So we urge you to approve this much smaller but vital grant to Goodwin Memorial. The next slide, please. The remaining recommendations in the historic preservation category are all for town owned buildings. The exquisite North Amherst Library, which will soon be expanded thanks to a generous donor, must first address the flexing of a load bearing wall in the basement. This wall under the main entrance is rolling inwards, endangering this historic structure. And we recommend $40,000 for this important repair. Next slide, please. Town Hall, a magnificent building constructed in, I think, 1890 or thereabouts, is showing its age in the condition of the grand front steps and side exit steps. The flight of granite steps at the front of the building has not been overhauled since it was constructed so long ago. The granite blocks are tipping and various joints are opening. Apparent, the apparent absence of a foundation is allowing water to be absorbed and causing efflorescence of salts. The town wishes to completely dismantle and then rebuild the steps on an adequate foundation taking special care to study the original grout and use an appropriate replacement. The side steps are in better condition, but it is desirable to have one contractor rebuild both stairs in one project to ensure consistency of materials and workmanship. Doing the two projects at once also saves money. We therefore recommend an award of $265,000 for this work. I would add that the town recently restored the beautiful front doors and may pursue a redesign of the North Common opposite. And it is reasonable to repair the stairs now since they join these two features. Next slide, please. Various roof repairs must be made to Town Hall and the Munson Memorial Library. And we recommend $83,500 for these repairs uh, which include replacing slates, matching the original slates with materials from the same quarries, and adding flashing and gutters to the library to keep water from entering through the roof and, conducting wa and to conduct water away from the foundation. As is the case for the Goodwin Memorial Church, addressing deficiencies in the building envelope is critical pr for preserving these historic structures. Next slide, please. The final recommendation in the category of historic preservation is for additional funds for the restoration and redesign of the North Common. We recommend $250,000 from the historic preservation uh, category, as well as an additional $250,000 from the recreation category. And you council are already deep in study of this project, so I will not say more about it now. Next slide, please. Two additional projects in the recreation category complete our recommendations for fiscal year 2022. As, as I said, there were no proposals this year pertaining to open space. We recommend an award of $45,000 to replace an exceedingly dilapidated pavilion at Groff Park. The lower pavilion is a rusty, leaky construction of wood and sheet metal built into bare ground. The town wishes to replace it with a new structure, highly similar, if not identical to the popular new pavilion, the one in the photograph, that was installed next to the new playground and would install it on a concrete pad. 
Next slide, please. Finally, we recommend an award of $65,000 for repairs to the Mill River Pool. Excuse me. The concrete pool basin itself is in a sorry state with cracks right through that let water in during the winter. In addition, the worn surface of the concrete no longer holds the waterproof epoxy coating well. The project will involve sandblasting the interior to create a surface that will hold a durable waterproof coating and assessing and repairing cracks. This work would be undertaken after the pool closes next summer. That concludes our recommendations. I welcome your questions. Um, Sarah, that was extremely informative and I wanna thank you for being willing to jump in and do it this evening. I wanna make a couple of preliminary statements. We are not, I repeat, we are not going to discuss the library um, grant tonight. It's off the table, okay? Second all, the questions that you are asking are ones that you want to make sure that predominantly the finance committee can answer in coming back to you with a recommendation. So Dorothy, let's start with you. I, I just want to second what you said, Lynn. It was a great report. I love the pictures. I love the clarity. And I think your narration was really great. So you get an A. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Alyssa? I think in the end, <laughs> I was set up. I was set up now. Okay. <laughs> in the interest of time, I won't go into great detail on this, but one of the things that used to come up at representative town meeting every so often was what about funds that were appropriated but had not actually been deployed? And so looking at those hanging on funds from previous times, obviously there are times projects go wrong, people don't bid on them, all sorts of things can happen. But for example, something that's not on this year's report but is listed in the um, unused appropriations is $125,000 for Mill River basketball courts. And again, I'll shorten the narrative here, but town meeting originally approved that money in spring of 2017, more money in spring of 2018. We got two, uh, completion dates associated with that well prior to the pandemic. And when we drove by last week, it's rubble. So what is the Community Preservation Act's view of its role in terms of keeping track of that sort of thing, like annual reports or quarterly reports back as to what happened? I noticed that there has been added since the days of representative town meeting, which goes to show we do learn things. Um, there's a, now an affirmation statement on the current applications that say you can have this money for three years, but unless you get an extension, you're gonna the money's gonna get rolled back in. And so the basketball courts would seem to be one of those issues, except it does seem to finally be underway. And so is there a plan to update the community, say, you know, every every year on, yes, we thought this was gonna happen, this didn't happen, and we changed our mind on this other one. So I want to make sure that in addition to putting Sarah on the spot for this, we asked whether uh, Sonia or Anthony have responses. Sarah? Well, the reason I asked is because it, I feel like it's CPA, what's, what's CPA members desire, like maybe they've had this conversation, as opposed to somebody giving me an answer as to what happened with the basketball courts, which frankly, I don't care about right now. What I want to know is the larger picture. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'll, I'll start. Um, we did have exactly those conversations. Um, the committee feels like we never, we never hear back. You know, the decisions, we make recommendations and then time passes and and there has been no mechanism really for um uh informing the committee um and kind of the public at large about what happens i mean it's pretty obvious if if a big project is completed we all see it um so it was because of discussions within the committee that that statement and that general policy have been added about um using it or losing it um, but we do recognize that there are some kinds of projects for exact uh, for example the valley cdc project that that are probably just going to take longer and we recognize that um, 
but we do want to turn the heat up a little bit on on some of the um, grant recipients to to get the work done and the finance department uh, made a big effort <laughs> in the fall and brought in a lot of money it just closed out a lot of projects that had balances hanging on you know and just talked to them and said and and, and closed them so so i know they're um working hard on that uh perhaps anthony or sonia would like to say something about that matter anthony um sarah has uh i think covered pretty much all of it but the uh the finance department did uh, starting with its oldest and most outstanding articles, uh, start closing things this fall. Uh, I think, Sonia will correct me if I'm wrong, everything older than 2017 has been has been dealt with. Uh, and the committee will start, uh, the committee has on its spring agenda to talk about the process for bringing people in for progress reports and uh, talking about that review process and taking a more active role. I, I don't remember if we, I think it will begin with this current uh, set of projects that uh, the recipients will be expected to file. I don't remember what we decided either every six months or at least. I don't think, I don't think have decided, but. I'm sorry, yeah. okay. They yeah. will be expected to file regular report updates to the, to the committee on how the work is going. I mean, the finance department, of course, is always keeping track of the money, but the committee hasn't hasn't had any feedback of the kind you've described and we we would like it so i'd say we're on that yeah I, I just want you to know that we're all work the finance department we're all anthony holly and i have been talking about getting a process in place where we might have just one meeting a year where everybody would come in that still had outstanding money and justify why they haven't <laughs> spent it yet and there's also, a, um, we're asking them to file a report. We're looking at a form for doing that. I'm all for closing out older money. I push that all the time. I just want you to know that. But sometimes things happen, you know. Um, I'm not sure what happened with the basketball courts. At this point, I don't have the reports in front of me to be able to tell you what they said. But there are things out there that have been bugging me too, and they will get closed if they don't use them this year. I think in the case of the basketball report uh, uh, courts, um, the rec department LSSE at the time was applying for other grants to do to do bigger overhauls of the the Mill River facility, and wanted to then use the basketball court money as part of a larger project. They didn't get the grants, and now they know they need. They, I think I think they're going to get it done. <laughs> Paul was nodding his head earlier, so maybe. Mm -hmm. that that work will move forward. Kathy, you have your hand up and Kathy is the liaison to this committee. I'm unmuting. Um, yes, I am. And it's a wonderful committee to be a liaison on because it's a great group with um, active conversations on these issues. I have, I, I am going to, I'm on the finance committee, as you know, Sarah. So when you come to us, I just have a couple requests, not so much questions. Um, both the report that Alyssa just asked for, I know there, you brought that to us last year, which was a outstanding money and where the dollars are, you know, how much has been spent so we could take a look at all of that. So I think making that part of a report for us would be really useful, even if there aren't answers to some of these things, you know, is it millions of dollars? And the other, and the second one, it's one that I saw was, um, Sonia's been preparing for you, but as um, the, uh, allocation of the money is made, but it's going to be with a grant. So things like 132 Northampton um, Road or the new Belchertown, it's going to incur debt service out in future years. And it would be good, I think, for us as a council, but first finance committee to see the best guess of what that looks like right now for the next 10 years. And I know you asked for that at CPAC. So it's yes. Some things are being paid down, but if the following go through, there's going to be this much because what it says is how much money are we going to have in next year, the year after, and the year after that's not already spoken for, you know, with a, if we 
keep getting. So I just think it's a useful thing because although we can incur debt, it does influence decisions you can make in the future. So just knowing the extent we've done that, and you had a great discussion about that. So it's more just to make that part of the current year request, have that picture be in it as well. That's it. Yep, mm -hmm. right, will do. You have your hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to respond to that a little. If you look at the um, CPI report, the appendixes, there is a report on there that shows the balances. Of older, and there's also a debt schedule I added to it this year. Yeah, and 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 Sonia, I know it's there, but it's not doesn't always come in the same package that uh, Sarah CPAC would bring to us. So I just think as an added background, oh. rather than us people having to go and find it, I, I I realize that you've been generating it. I just think it's a useful. Uh, I happen to have it because I was at a CPAC meeting and you had sent me it when Sarah had asked for it, but I just to make it part of this reporting when we get the annual allocation for the next year. Thanks. Kat. Okay, that spreadsheet. Yeah, I know what exactly what you are asking for. Okay. Uh, I'm just going to exercise my right as a counselor and ask that when you come to the finance committee, you also be prepared for talking about reimbursements and what kind of evidence people have to provide in order to be reimbursed. Okay. That's my only question at this point. Are there any other questions or issues? And I'm seeing no energy uh, <laughs> for this to either TSO or to CRC. And so I'm going to just assume that the automatic referral to finance committee takes care of it. Sarah, thank you. Anthony, thank you. And Sonia, thank you for all that you do for this committee. And uh, to the committee, uh, several of whom have joined us in the audience. Oh, good. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Good night. It's 8 o'clock. We are on schedule. We're going to take a 10-minute break, and we will be back. Please mute, close down your video, and when you come back, don't unmute, but please open your video. Thank you. Uh, I just want to quickly make sure everybody can hear me and I can hear them. Uh, we start with Darcy DeMont. I'm here. Um, Lynn Griesmer is yes. Uh, Mandy Jo? Present. Uh, Dorothy Pam? Present. Evan Ross? Present. George Ryan? Present. Kathy Shane? Here. Steve Schreiber? Here. Andy Steinberg. Present. Sarah Schwartz. Present. Melanie. I'm here. Melissa. Present. And Pat. Present. Okay. Um, two weeks ago, we had a presentation by the Community Safety Working Group, and they submitted a letter. Uh, I have drafted a response to that letter and it is in your packet. I will also tell you that I am in the process of assembling the other requests that they have made during their meeting, though not in our council meeting, and that is a link to the various um, meetings that the council has had where various people spoke about the police. And in addition to that, assembling all of the emails sent to the council and including response on such, and we're in the process of putting that packet together, and I will forward that. So the motion tonight is, um, we've already suspended the rules, it's to authorize the town council president to send the letter to the community safety working group dated February 8th, 2021, on behalf of the town council as presented. Is there a second? I will, I will second that, and to move us along, I'd like to immediately call the question. Okay. Uh, the question has been called that requires a two thirds vote and uh, it immediately goes to vote. So what you're voting on is whether or not we will proceed to vote. This is a calling of the question. Um, and I will begin with uh, Griesmer and uh, I. Haneke? Aye. Sam? Yes. 
Ross. Aye. Ryan. Aye. Jane. Abstain. Uh, Schreiber. Aye. Steinberg. No. Schwartz. Aye. Balmilm. Yes. Brewer. Abstain. And DeAngelis. Aye. DeMont. No. Okay, so I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine votes, two thirds. We will move immediately to the question. And the motion is as follows. Um, to authorize the town council president to send the letter to the community safety working group dated February 8th, 2021 on behalf of the town council as presented. And um, since the motion was made to call the question, there's no debate, so we move on. Um, uh, can I make, ask a point of order or I don't know whether I can do that here. I, I'm just, uh, I've never seen that done before, asked to call the question before there's been any discussion at all. A, a, a counselor may call the question anytime they want. That is anti-democratic. Uh, so I have a point of order also, and I voted yes on the, the question, but there were basically two motions on the same Maybe I'm just left over from town meeting, but in town meeting, you at least, if you're gonna call the question, that had to be the first thing you did. I don't know if there's anything on Roberts or our own rules that have that same. I'm more than willing to have anybody weigh in. Mandy Joe, you usually have some sense of Roberts rules of order. I don't think there's anything in our council rules that prevented Evan from doing what he did, which was second a motion, and then he was recognized and called the question at that recognition, um, and that question received two thirds. And so there is no debate, but point of orders can still be raised. I would like to ask my colleague, Mr. Ross, why he chose to call the question. I wanted to move us along to this agenda, but I, I also think that we we voted on it and it passed so we need to move on that's not an explanation that's too bad so the motion is on the table and it's to authorize the town council president to send the letter to the community safety working group dated february 8th 2021 on behalf of the town council as presented um we are going to begin with the vote mandy joe Haneke. yes Dorothy Pam. Abstain. Kevin Ross. Yes. George Ryan. Yes. Kathy Shane. Abstain. Steve Fry. Yes. Andy Steinberg. No. Sarah Schwartz. Yeah. By the time they hear, they'll change how this board works. Yep. Shelley Balmilm? Yes. Elizabeth? Abstain. Pat DeAngelis? Yes. Darcy DeMont? Abstain. Lynn Griesmer is a yes. It passes eight. Uh, four, one opposed, and four abstentions. Yeah, and that's four. what I have. Okay, thank you. Uh, we're going to go on to the use of the public way, wayfinding signs, and that's a presentation that Dave Zomack, uh, the assistant town manager, Chris Brestrip, and the uh, planning director, and Ben Rieger. The planner is making. Did I get the pronunciation of your name correct, Ben? Correct. Thanks. All right, we're going to have the slides. Great. Yeah, I have the slideshow here. Um, so I'll pull that up. 
And let me start the slideshow. And then, uh, Chris, do you want to start with a few words? Yes, thank you. Good evening. My name is Christine Brester, Planning Director. And tonight we're coming before you to introduce the Wayfinding Sign Project. Our primary goal for tonight is to give you a general overview of the project and to request approval for the locations of some signs that are proposed to be within the public right of way. We understand that you may wish to refer this project to one of the council committees for a recommendation. Ben Breger, planning planner in the planning department will now present the sign project to you. Thank you. Great, thank you, Chris. Um, hello, everyone, and thanks for this opportunity. Um, my name is Ben Breger, and I'm a planner in the planning department here in Amherst. Um, so I'm going to walk you through uh, an overview of the Wayfinding Signs project, starting with some of the goals and history of the project, and then show you where we're at with some of the sign uh, design and uh, our proposed locations, um, some of which are not in the public right of way, are either on private property or in the state right of way, but the majority of which are in the public right of way. And that's the reason we're coming before you today to um, have your review and ultimately approval of those sign locations. Um, so I'm gonna start with a little bit about the project goals. Um, you know, wayfinding signs are a means to accomplish a lot of different goals. There's an economic development goal here, which is to direct people towards our downtown and to keep them downtown and keep them interested and show them all the types of um, services and opportunities there are downtown, such as parks and municipal buildings, businesses, um, cultural institutions. It's also a really important part of economic recovery from pan the pandemic, um, emphasizing the vitality of downtown businesses and uh, downtown as a destination. Um, you know, it's it's uh, it's also about it's it's also about different destinations around town. So you know, we want to direct people to town center, but also let them know about different options outside of downtown and north and south Amherst. And then, lastly, the, we've worked a lot with our designer on the actual design of the signs, and we want that to reflect the town character and kind of give this give the town a sense of place um, that comes along with the signs. So. With those goals in mind, um, I just want to back up a little bit and talk about, you know, where how we got to this point. So, um, as many of you know, uh, in Amherst, there's kind of a mishmash of different wayfinding signs um, that have come with multiple, you know, iterations of wayfinding efforts in the town. So, in the top left, you know, that's the I think one of the last remaining um, directional posts signs from I think like an early 90s uh, wayfinding effort. Um, there's a kiosk near Amherst Works that I think is pretty defunct now, but it, it used to have this Amherst Center logo on it. But I think this is the last remaining one near Kendrick Park. Um, there's also a lot of these kind of like more traffic oriented uh, Amherst Center signs. Um, this one's on Kendrick Park, but also there's one along the commons and um, kind of on, on Route 9 directing folks downtown. And then in conjunction, there's also uh, a, a lot of these parking signs pointing out various um, parking lots and parking garages. So what we're trying to do is kind of um, uh, bring, to bring all of the wayfinding signs into one style and keep things consistent. So um, I'm going to start with a little bit of project history. Um, I will admit I've you know only worked for the town for about a year now, and this project has had a long history. So I'm going to you know uh, summarize what I know from 2015, and Chris and Dave can fill in any details. But um, this began this this iteration of the wayfinding project began with a state grant in 2015, and that catalyzed the formation of a working group. Um, which consisted of the university, the bid, the chamber, Dickinson Museum, select board, and town staff. Um, that working group wor worked with a designer to develop a family of signs. However, um, the working group ended up not being totally satisfied with the design of those signs. And then um, by 2017, the town um, 
hired Seth Gregory from Seth Gregory Designs in Northampton, um, who began working with the town on developing a new family of signs for the wayfinding project downtown. Um, there was a public process uh, that the select board um, ran in 2017 and 2018, and they approved a, the family of signs in 2018. And to, town meeting then authorized $90,000 at the, two, at the 2018 annual town meeting, much of which we still retain. And then um, since then, the planning department, um, myself, Chris, and others have continued to work with Seth Gregory to refine the design standards and the family of signs. Um, we've, in the past year since I've joined, we've um, brought the design and uh, approval of locations through various boards and committees, um, including the Design Review Board, the Local Historic District Commission, and Zoning, boards of Appeal, Zoning Board of Appeals um, for the signs that needed their approval. I will say a related um, sign is the BID, the Business Improvement District, placed the sign at the roundabout. Um, that's something that they, the BID paid for and, um, and fabricated at the Triangle Street roundabout. Um, it's similar to the town design, which I'll share with you um, shortly. Um, so there is an element of the wayfinding sign project installed already. Um, so now I'm going to talk to you about uh, where, where we are with the design design um, and our work with Seth Gregory. So uh, planning department staff, we've worked with Seth to develop these three types of signs, the welcome to Amherst signs, directional post signs, and then informational kiosks. Uh, these designs have been reviewed and approved by the design review board. And um, for the signs that are in the local historic district, the local historic district commission. The way, um, I will say the wayfinding design standards also informed the uh, SUFA design, SUFA signs. Um, which have been were approved and installed as well. So there's elements of the design already being used. So I'm gonna, gonna, gonna walk you through the through those three types of signs um, that we've been designing here. Uh, so we have the welcome sign. Um, this is about five, five, five feet three inches tall by six feet wide. Um, it has a uh, dark brown background. Uh, with an off-white lettering for Amherst and Massachusetts. The town seal and welcome is faded in the background. And then the green uh, panel is there to direct folks to the town center. And so that arrow will change directions depending on where the sign is located. Next, we have the directional post signs. These will be placed, you know, mostly on sidewalks and are oriented for drivers, but also pedestrians and cyclists. Um, they're seven feet tall at their base um, and you know, include eight panels for various destinations around town. And we've included this little, what I call a hat on top, just to give it a little decorative touch as well. Um, next, we have two types of informational kiosks that are, um, this one is six feet tall and will include uh, a small map as well as different, you know, walking and uh, cycling times to various destinations around town. And then a slightly larger informational kiosk is what we're calling the arrival kiosk. Um, we'll just have uh, a larger map with more destinations available. So that's the uh, um, kind of family of signs in the same design that uh, we've been developing. And now I'm going to talk about the various locations that we're proposing for these signs. So um, the locations, uh, they've been developed, the, the, the ideas for the locations um, coming out of the 2017 working group with the select board. Um, and then in the, in the past, uh, I guess, three to four years, we've been finalizing those locations with the planning staff and Department of Public Works. We have, um, at this point, we're thinking, planning on doing four welcome signs located at key gateways to downtown Amherst. And then we have in mind 10 directional post signs that are uh, situated in downtown at key intersections and at important destinations. And like I mentioned before, uh, 
most of the signs are in the public right away, town owned public right away, and others are in private property or in the state right of way, and those are treated slightly differently. Um, and as mentioned before, the locations and design have been approved as needed by the DRB, Local Historic District Commission and the ZBA. So next I'm gonna show a series of maps that show these locations. Um, so in red, um, I'm showing the four welcome signs. And then in green are the 10 directional post signs. And I'm gonna zoom into downtown shortly, but I just wanted to show the overview of the four welcome signs. So just to orient you, um, we're gonna start, I guess, in the uh, Northwest here. So this is the intersection of Amity Street, University Drive, and then Rocky Hill Road coming in from Hadley. So this, this is a place where we can intercept traffic that's either coming you know, from the Rocky Hill Road, Rocky Hill Road shortcut um, and directing, letting them know that town center is straight ahead and they can continue up the hill as opposed to, you know, turning towards the U university or down University Drive. Um, similar situation um, on the corner of uh, Northampton Road and University Drive. Um, as I'll, I'll discuss this later, this location is not final. We're looking at a putting this sign somewhere along the stretch of Route 9 here. Um, but the idea is to, you know, let visitors know coming, um, coming, I guess this would be coming from the east, uh, sorry, coming from the west up Route 9 that um, they can continue up the hill towards town center. Because for both of these places, it's not always obvious that um, you go up, to continue up the hill and you're going to reach a uh, a downtown uh, destination, um, especially at Route 9 is a, you know, regional commuter road. Um, continuing to the east, uh, we have the two welcome signs up here. Uh, this is actually one of the ones that is in, on private property on the Emily Dickinson Museum property. And that's one that one has been treated differently. And we've worked closely with the Amherst College and the Emily Dickinson Museum staff and the local historic district to finalize the details of that sign. And then second, uh, for, finally, we have the fourth sign located um, on the corner of the town common. Um, and as a, you know, to, one to kind of let people know they're entering Amherst Town Center and to again, direct them towards Town Center as opposed to just continuing down Route 9. Um, so I'll continue now to the directional post signs, the 10 locations we've identified. Um, I think I'll just kind of say a few words about each one, but don't want to exhaust um, the point. Um, the idea here is to kind of catch both drivers, but also pedestrians and cyclists to direct them towards key destinations downtown and um, catch them also at key intersections where their you know need to make a turn to go a certain to a certain destination so coming from the north um you know this is along kendrick park here you know so it, this is a tough place because some people take the shortcut down north pleasant street to get to town but others stay in the roundabout here so having a sign here allows you to catch um the the folks coming down i guess this is triangle street um and then having a sign here lets you catch the intercept the people coming down North Pleasant Street on the other side of Kendrick Park. This sign location was also chosen because there's the um, shortcut to West Cemetery through the, down the alleyway next to One East Pleasant Street, which is an important but often overlooked historical and cultural um, open space. Um, I, we proposed this sign here kind of as a mid block along North Pleasant Street and to direct people down Boltwood Alley, um, Boltwood Walk, sorry, towards the, such important um, destinations as the Bank Center, you know, which, which houses the Health Center and Senior Center. And then the four signs that are along Main Street and Amity Street are meant to um, kind of intercept um, visitors coming by foot uh, car or bicycle, directing them towards parking, town hall, Jones Library, various places downtown. 
And similarly, the uh, the three that we're proposing along Route Nine and South Pleasant Street here, once you're come, once you know you you would have already hit the welcome signs as you as you're coming from either direction up Route Nine, but then to know once you hit this intersection that you need to continue to the right or to the left, um, and the various destinations that you'll be able to visit in those directions. Um, so like I mentioned before, um, of the 14 signs total, um, that's, that is 10 welcome signs and four, uh, sorry, four welcome signs and 10 directional signs. Um, 11 are in the public right of way and would require town council approval to be placed there. And then the other three, one being along route, two being along route nine are in the state right of way. And then the third is on the Emily Dickinson Museum uh, or Amherst College property and would be treated differently. So I'm just gonna zoom in quickly to the four welcome sign locations, um, just to discuss, uh, show those uh, rendered and um, discuss any details of their uh, specific locations. Um, this one is the one on the Northeast uh, at the intersection of Amity and University Drive this one, this sign would be treated a little bit differently because it, we're proposing to have a two-sided sign where the others um, I think are all one-sided. We thought it was important to have two faces here because it's in catching cars coming south on North University Drive and north on University Drive to send them up the hill up Amity Street towards Amherst Town Center. And this is a you know idea of what it could look like in place. Um, the, secondly, we have the uh, proposed sign on the uh, corner of the town common as you would come up Route 9. Um, the idea here is to um, intercept drivers and cyclists and pedestrians coming up the hill and direct them towards town center and to welcome them to Amherst, essentially, Amherst Town Center, that is. So the Third sign is at, located at the Emily Dickinson Museum at the corner of Triangle and Main Street. This one again is going to be treated differently for a few reasons. First of all, it's actually on private property. The property is owned by the Amherst College who, who owns the Emily Dickinson Museum and planning department staff um, have come to an agreement um, with Amherst College and have worked closely with them to design this sign and it's actually going to replace the current sign that's located there, which is small, but you know, this sign here that says existing. Um, and we're gonna replace it, proposing to replace it with a welcome sign that also it will include a panel um, directing uh, visitors to the Emily Dickinson Museum entrance. And I will say this, this sign is um, not that much taller than the current Emily Dickinson Museum sign, so, something when we, did the uh, rendering, it came up looking a lot bigger, but it's only um, six inches larger than the current sign there. Um, and it is, uh, it, it did receive approval from the Zoning Board of Appeals for being slightly oversized and the local historic district commission um, as it is in the local historic district. I'll uh, move quickly past these quick. Um, the, this is one, the one along Route 9 coming up Northampton Road is in the state right of way. Um, we have permission from the state DOT for a access permit to place the sign along a stretch of Route 9. Um, I guess slight, to be determined at this point exactly where along Route 9 it will be. Um, and there's also going to be some road work happening, I believe, in the in the fall of 21. And so we're proposing that possibly the, the sign could be placed and installed in conjunction with that road work. Um, and cause it's gonna need to, you know, interact with the sidewalk. And I will say we're also exploring options um, along the west side of, or the, yeah, sorry, the west of the University Drive intersection to catch um, drivers mostly before they hit the intersection of University Drive and to hopefully send more traffic up Northampton Road towards Town Center as opposed to 
all the people that take this shortcut to UMass. Um, this what along there's a lot of signs and driveways to deal with along this stretch of Route 9. So we're trying to work um, possibly with some private um, landowners to place the sign there. But our default option is right now is along Route 9 um, east of the intersection. Um, so I'm going to, uh, that's the welcome signs. And then I just briefly wanted to talk about the directional post signs. Um, you know, I will say this is a ongoing project and the list of kind of what we're actually pointing people to is going to develop over time. Um, and the nice thing about these panels is that they can be replaced and, you know, we can fabricate new ones as, as, um, downtown evolves and there's new destinations or, and so, but what we have in mind um, are various cultural institutions downtown, such as museums, the library. Um, we also want to direct people towards the municipal buildings that are highly trafficked, like town hall, especially um, the bank center, the senior center, the health center, um, open space and parks, which there are a lot of downtown, especially with the Kendrick playground underway. Sweetser Park, uh, certainly the Town Common as well, and West Cemetery for that matter. Um, parking is always an important one, something people are certainly looking for as they enter downtown. Um, the bid and the chamber have the visitor center um, along South Pleasant Street, which is an important place to get information both about the, about the region and the town. Certainly the colleges and the university are important destinations people are looking for. And then finally, um, destinations in North and South Amherst. And we were thinking maybe towards the periphery of downtown as people are on their way out, it would be nice to kind of let them know about certain destinations in North and South Amherst. So I'm gonna wrap up here with some uh, next steps. Um, what, we're, what we're looking for um, first is the approval from town council to place signs in the public way. Um, Next, we're gonna planning staff and the Department of Public Works, we're gonna finalize the sign design and destinations. We're gonna, once we have those two things, we will solicit bids for the fabrication and then move on to delivery and installation of the signs. Um, a suggested timeline, um, today is February 8th. So we're looking for a town council referral to the appropriate town council committee for review and recommendation, um, ideally by May 3rd, which would um, give time for review and changes and edits to be made. Um, from then we would work to put out a bid for fabrication. And then um, hopefully by, by mid June have a contract executed with a fabricator and then look to have installation in the late summer to early fall of 2021. So without, um, I think, yeah, that wraps it up. And I just want to thank you everyone for your time. And we welcome any questions you may have about this project. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Uh, mm -hmm. Please take the slide presentation down, we may have to bring it up if there's a question. Yeah, absolutely. Kathy. Just, uh, thanks. Thank you. Um, I, my question is on your last one or two, Ben, you said, and maybe say some things that aren't in the town center. Um, so, one of my my experience has been when I get asked for directions on where to go, it's very rare. Every once in a while, it's where's Amherst, you know, the town of Amherst, the downtown. But I'll be asked by someone in downtown, how do I get to the Mill River Recreation Area? How do I get to the uh, to the golf course? How do I get to the Eric Carl Museum? How do I get to the Yiddish Book Center, um, the Silvio Conte Trails? Um, you know, there, there are things that it's not clear whether you go north or south or east or west. So what I'm wondering um, is uh, some of those, um, the decision on 
how many things to put on a sign and mm-hmm. where and where to put them because you know i could list more where i saw downtown it was jones library and emily dickinson i mean i do get asked where emily dickinson is um because it's not clear to people when they get in the middle on wh- where to go um, and having a nice sign for that. But the um, village center in North and South is my question. And we have these ma- major thoroughfares. Um, so that's that's just a question. And I don't actually know whether you have to make all the decisions at the same time or not. So if I think of South Amherst, where we're talking about per- a redoing of an intersection. If you're coming east-west, you might want to know whether you turn right to go to Hampshire College or left, you know, when you're coming across Bay Road or across Pomeroy. So it's, you might decide later where you're going to put some of these, uh, if you want to go here or there. So it feels to me that that's often the kind of question I get, rather than once I've gotten as far as UMass and I'm coming toward town, We only have two streets, you know, like, you know, you know, town center. But so it's it's sort of a number of signs and where to place them, how that decision gets made. Um, That's my question. Ben, do you want to answer that or perhaps Chris or David? Or Paul? Um, I'll just jump in. I think I think the it's an evolving discussion about the number of signs and the destinations. And I think if, if you do too many destinations, then it it becomes information overload and you can't actually like chart out the path, like straight here for Jones library, then turn right here and then go straight here. And if you, if you focus on one fewer destinations, you can chart out a more direct path. But if you add more destinations, you sometimes leave people without, the final turn or something like that. Um, so I think it's a balance. Um, yeah, I, I'll just add on that. The, the decision for the council is, do you like this family of signs? Are you, re- are you willing to put them in, into the ground? And then we can talk more detail about exactly what they're, they include. Cause I think that is a very nuanced conversation to have. Um, I think one of the things that, one of the g- things that this came from, um, was that people would, when they're, the GPS tells them when they're coming from the east to go down Triangle Street before you even get to downtown and they go to UMass that way and then they leave town the same way and they don't even know town, the uh, town set that downtown Amherst exists or go in U- University Drive, people didn't even realize that there's a, a downtown Amherst. And that was the sort of genesis of this is my understanding. Mm-hmm. Uh, as I move on, I just wanna reemphasize our decision is the use of the public way. Right rather than get into which signs right yeah, and and i just i i, I asked it in that context lynn so when it gets so it's it's like how many of these things we want thank ever, you um rather mm. specific um because i think we could overdo it a lot with um uh trying to get a lot of things on a sign a lot of signs so got it challenging yeah, just um, through the racial equity lens to make uh, our sp- downtown more welcoming. Are we considering bilingual signs at all? Is that a thing? And also South Amherst could be, a, I mean, it, part of the Pomeroy cross section is wayfinding. I'm guessing it's going to be part of that process to, to have signs linking to our um you know, the, all the amazing things that are down in South Eric Carl's Museum and Hampshire College and um, all of those cool things in South Amherst. Okay. Um, okay, Dorothy. So I'm glad that Paul mentioned GPS because that refers to people driving. And so for me, the most important thing is, can I read it while I'm driving? And admittedly, I, you know, I'm just looking at pictures, but from the pictures, it looks as if like the sign that says to Amherst that the, with a little squiggly arrow, that that's too small. And there's two things going on here for me. I know this has been approved by a lot of people, but if there's one color, I would say do not use, it would be this pumpkin beige, which to me is like plastic man-made, um, is a pe- 
kind of a color of enemy, but it's not good contrast with the white letters. So if the sign doesn't work to tell the driver, zap, this direction, that direction, um, then it's not working. The ones with the little fins, uh, those are more for somebody walking or riding. Um, and I, I love the idea of being able to replace them and to do that. So I think, um, I think that's really good. Now, in reference to what Lynn said, what we have to decide, do we give them a, a, the public way? I think you've done a great job of finding certainly the core places to put signs. I do agree with Shalini that the south part of Amherst needs to be included in a sign. But I, I think that, you know, thinking of how does somebody approach Amherst, you've done a great job of saying, this is a good place to let them know. This is a good place without overdoing it. So um, it's, a, it's a great project, but it's too bad UMass took um, garnet, okay? That's the great color. Um, but I, I would hope for a change of, of uh, color with better contrast in the wording with the white print. So thank you very much. Melissa? Oh, David, you, I'm sorry. David, you have your hand up and I'm thinking maybe you wanna answer a question. Yeah, thanks, Lynn. I'll be very brief. Um, I, I wanted to echo kind of Paul and Ben's comments about we're, we're very cognizant of over, over signing, over signage. Um, but I also wanted to add that uh, Alyssa and Andy and others may recall that um, years ago when we started this project, the first phase was really to focus on downtown. We fully intend at some point to come back to you, come back in future years to expand this effort uh, more fully north and south. We'll we'll do the very best we can with the with the funds allocated, but you know. Um, we, we want to get down into South Amherst, into East Amherst. Um, I think uh, Ben had me mentioned really um, uh, placemaking and consistency of signage. When we think, uh, and, and just for a minute, think about what does the sign look like at uh, Plumbrook Recreation Area? What does the sign look like at Groff Park? What does the sign look like at Mill River? They're all different eras. They're all different uh, styles. We want to have a consistent style and a consistent family throughout town that that brings places, as Kathy was saying, to the to the north, to the southeast, et cetera. Um, anyway, we don't want to send too many people over to the Conti Refuge Trails. I get a little <laughs> about that myself. But um, anyway, we want them to enjoy our trails. But anyway, thank you. Thanks. Uh, Alyssa. Not questions, but a little more context. One is that, as Dave said, and as the report indicated, we've been talking about this for a long time. And over that time, the styles changed a lot. So Dorothy, the colors that you're seeing now, the typeface you're seeing now, they've got nothing to do with what the select board approved at one point in the past. They are very different. And so things evolve over time. Um, and UMass put up a bunch of new signs like in between those discussions. So um, just a lot of things have evolved. And obviously Design Review Board and others that are more attuned to design have worked on this as well as the planning professionals. But I do want to push back on the fact that this idea is being promoted that the only thing the town council's doing is deciding if this goes in the public way. One of the ways you decide whether or not it goes in the public way is if you don't like it. If you don't like it, then you don't give approval to put it in the public way. Just like for the farmer's market, the farmer's market parking is in the public way. If you're unhappy with something the farmer's market is doing, as we were many years ago, we had to work that out before we agreed to let them use the public way. The question is not just, are the, is this the right spot in the public way? The question is also, are these the kind of signs we want? I'm not disagreeing with the signs. And frankly, it's I'm worn down by this conversation having had it for a very long time. But um, I will not agree that our only role is whether or not they go in the public way, because if it's something we think is appalling, then we shouldn't let it go in the public way. I don't think that's the case here, but I also think that it is. there's a line in there as to how much quibbling we do over which Pantone shade it is. Thank you. And I, I agree with that. Uh, Christine, you have your hand up. So did you want to add to that? Well, thank you. I just wanted to respond to Dar Dorothy's concern about the color and the color of the signs in the roundabout at Triangle Street and East Pleasant is not indicative of the signs that we're proposing currently. That is 
indicative of the bid and their installation of those signs, but we're choosing a more rich dark brown and a white rather than the orangey color and the yellow of the lettering. So thank you for that comment. And thanks for that clarification. Uh, Steve Schreiber. Yeah, so I don't think the signs are even so much about wayfinding because I was trying to think last time I was even asked a question of how to get somewhere, but I think they're really more for branding. And I, you know, so in other words, I think that there are to sort of in, in, set up an expectation uh, regarding the community that you're about to enter or the community in which you are. So for those reasons, I think it's a pretty classy, I mean, I think the new design is actually pretty classy and I'm totally on board. Are there any other questions at this point? George. Just quickly, it's also a nice way to knit the community together. It creates a kind of common element. And if, if this goes forward in time, which it sounds like it will, it will add to that sense of, of community. So I like it at that in that regard as well. Okay. Um, so the motion is the following, to refer the wayfinding recommendations to the town services and outreach committee for review and recommendation to the council by May 3rd, 2021. Ryan, second. Okay, is there further discussion? Okay, seeing none, I'm going to move to- I'm sorry, I do have my hand raised. I'm sorry, Alyssa, go ahead. No problem. Um, just in regards to the referral, I know that in theory, this is a TSO issue. What I'm wondering is what on earth TSO is gonna do with it. Um, we're not gonna quibble over details. We don't want the same presentation we just had to the full town council. So what's our value add at TSO? So the alternative is not to refer and to bring it back at um, our next meeting for a vote. I'm waiting for comments. Pat DeAngelis. That makes sense to me is to bring it back to our next, next meeting for a vote. I don't think it has to go to committee. Okay, Shalini. Do we want any community um, feedback? Like just from different angles of the people who tend to use these, um, I don't know, related to people. I don't know, I'm just getting, thinking. Uh, like people with disabilities, colorblindness, or uh, people, you know, multilingual feedback, just getting feedback. Is that something the TSO, is that going to be helpful? No, I can see Alyssa like, no. <laughs> um, I mean, I mean, the besides branding, I think that's totally true. It is about branding, but I have heard about people not knowing where the parking is when people come out of from out of town or not finding destination areas and we should be promoting them like oh we have this amazing museum here and so forth so i think it is important and and yeah i just like and also like the point is to make our place inviting to people from all cultures and so just even though we can't possibly put multiple languages but if Paul has a sense of what are the languages that are mostly in use in our town or by visitors, students. Maybe that's something to, it's even if they don't use it, most people maybe know English. I think it just creates that sense of we are working towards building an inclusive, inviting community. Mandy Jo. Yeah, so on the similar note as Shalini, I guess, if we don't refer this to TSO, my question is, does the council after voting, say in two weeks, ever see this project again? Because I think there were a lot of good questions brought up about the current sort of inclusion of different languages or what, how do you decide which, you know, cultural institutions you put on them and where they go, um, that if we won't ever have an ability to converse on that again, if we don't refer that to TSO or to bring those to have that conversation, even if TSO doesn't do much other than wait for the town staff to think about that and give more recommendations, that's worth to me referring it to TSO versus 
never seeing this project again or hearing about whether those recommendations or concerns were taken into account. All right, uh, Dorothy. I think Sean, you brought up a great point about colorblindness. And if I remember, and I may have this totally wrong, uh, Paul, aren't you colorblind? So just, just put the signs past Paul. Um, I think we need to make sure, we, people forget to think about that. We just don't think about it, but we have to think about it. And also, I, you know, I was talking about the size of letters and the legibility. Um, I think that the town could have a few welcome signs. Um, I've seen welcome signs with many languages on them, and uh, we could have a custom made one which would include Cambodian, which I think is a one of our town languages. Um, I think that's a, some great ideas there. So just wanted to give my approval. Kathy. Um, um, I'm going to second these as suggestions. And then the other one was, uh, where do I find parking? I believe parking was a separate issue. You know, one of the reports from the parking committee is that we inconsistently, you can't easily find where you can park. And we don't always have a parking sign with the same P on it and stuff. And it seems to me that's a separate issue from the kinds of signage we've done. And these are fancier in some level than you need for a parking sign, but we do need, you know, not just parking this way, here is parking and here's some parking um, on our little pieces of parking. So am I right that parking is a separate issue from just these signs, yeah. And, th and then my only other thing is on the languages and the welcoming and the branding. If we keep these downtown kiosks that we're trying out, um, that could be a place where you do on one side of them, a welcome to Amherst and Bienvenido or, you know, different languages just quickly on it, you know, with a one kind of a welcoming branding. And, and that could, change over time if uh, which of those signs so we don't have to put everything into a permanent sign you know we can we have that one where those can change um just to we 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 could be over signage downtown but but you know we're we're not right at the cusp of that yet all right i'm going to suggest that i'm hearing that there's a couple reasons to refer to TSO. One is to give the opportunity for the public to make any additional comments and to just advance to the town council and the town some of the ideas addressed here tonight in a report back to the council. Um, with that, the motion that's on the table that's been seconded is to refer the wayfinding recommendations to the town services and outreach committee for review and recommendation to the council by May 3rd. 2021 is the discussion. Please mute. Thank you. Um, all right, seeing none, then we'll start with Dorothy Pam. Uh, yes. Evan Ross. Yes. George Ryan. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. Steve Schreiber. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Sarah Schwartz. Aye. Aye. Uh, Shalini Balmilm. Yes. Liz Brewer. No. Patty Angelus. No. Darcy Dumont. Yes. Uh, Lynn Griesmer is a no. And Mandy Johanneke. Aye. Okay, the motion passes, 10 in favor, three opposed, no abstentions and no absence. Okay, we're moving on to the next item on our agenda, mm. no longer on schedule. Um, and that is the amendment to the town council rules of procedure. And George, I believe you are up along with Mandy Joe, who put the slides together. And um, this is coming out of GOL. Yes, Lynn, thank you. Um, if we could, uh, thank you, Mandy, or whoever's controlling the slides. 
has the slides. Tina, thank you, Tina. Can you enlarge them? No. Ah, thank you. So, um, GUL <clears throat> met on January 20 and also February 3rd over two sessions. It had uh, proposed a number of changes that are in this document. Uh, in both cases, the vote was unanimous, five to zero. And what I'd like to do for very few minutes is take you through this. This is the first reading. So um, we'll come back to this again. And uh, so if we could begin um, with rule 2.1, um, the election of officers. And um, this essentially lays out the process uh, that we follow. We felt that this would be something appropriate to put into the rules, the actual process we follow. And um, I wanna draw your attention to two specific items. D4 um, is the first um, in which, uh, basically what it says is the presiding officer will open the floor to counselors, excluding nominees to make one brief statement if they wish on the election of the office up to two minutes. This is different from the process we followed previously and the thinking was that the previous process was somewhat awkward. If you remember, basically we called the roll and everyone either had to say something or say, I don't wanna say something. And uh, in discussion, it was felt that this was rather awkward and somewhat uh, kind of put a burden on people to feel like they had to do something when they maybe didn't. So here the thought is that at this point in the process, the presiding officer would simply open the floor. And if someone wishes to make a statement on behalf of a candidate, they may. And if they don't have anything to say, then they don't have to say anything. So that's one change from the process that we're used to. The second is in D5, the very next item. Um, the idea was to, or the suggestion, is to go to a written ballot. Um, and the argument here is that this would basically allow people to vote without uh, being influenced by what has happened previously in the course of the, the voting. Uh, and also in the case of where at some point it might be clear a certain candidate has won um, and somewhat make your vote maybe seem meaningless. But so that was the second change that we propose that it be done by a written ballot. It was acknowledged that in the age of COVID, uh, in the age of Zoom, this may present some challenges, but uh, um, our council clerk uh, suggested that she she could manage it, she would figure out a way to deal with it. And hopefully the next time uh, the council has to do this, um, we will be meeting uh, face to face. So that's 2.1. I don't know if we want to, Lynn, if you want to open it to questions or you want to go through the entire uh, list. Um, Why don't you go through the entire list and then I'll ask the questions okay, based good. on each right. of them, okay? That's fine by me. Um, the next is 4.3, um, called Additional Public Comments. So I'm gonna wait till it comes up on the screen. Here is a very small change, simply changing the word shall to may. And this change is based on our actual experience that in fact, the presiding officer, and I think in all the cases it's been the president, um, does in fact exercise some discretion over when and where public comment will take place. So um, this was a suggestion simply uh, to reflect the actual practice that we follow. That's 4.3. 5.7 uh, on open meeting and initiatives. Here, um, and good, thank you. Um, Mandy's added also Appendix B um, in the screen. Otherwise you have to scroll as I have to all the way to the end of the document. Um, so basically here, um, it, it spells out um, the, uh, the process that makes clear um, basically spells out the process for open meetings per charter section 8.1. Um, a lot of time was spent in our discussion over the question of how old, um, what age would be appropriate um, for signatures to count. And since the charter is quite explicit, 8.1 makes it 18 years and older, what we decided is while that issue was not resolved and I think perhaps should be uh, brought back for further discussion, we needed to simply create a process that reflected the current charter language. And so um, that's something that, as I mentioned in my report, um, may, may very well uh, come back at some later point, but uh, given the uh, charter language, um, the language 18 and older is, is in the charter. And so that is what this reflects. Um, what else? Um, and so I, I think also um, this allows for both paper and electronic submissions. Um, so we use the word paper deliberately um, to make it clear um, and also electronic so that um, people understand it can be done either way. 
Um, if you look at the Appendix B, that's meant to reflect then the language of the process that is in front of you, um, basically requiring a legible name, a legible address, um, and then again, check if 18 or older. Um, here, the thinking is that um, since we decided not to decide about age, that we would leave this open so that younger people could be encouraged to sign it, but it would be made clear both by this check and also by language above that for it to actually be counted, officially you must be 18 or older. And then you're given a choice as to one of three things you can provide for the purposes of validation. Um, I think there's also what we might draw your attention to the notification process and in section D, um, there may be some thought on that uh, later or some questions about that, um, but the, this is the language that we chose, at least for the moment. Um, and I can't read it, but maybe I can find it on my screen. Uh, okay. The first 10 residents, George. Yeah, thank you. Um, so essentially, yeah. Okay. All right, so um, next would be uh, Rule 6.3 D and E. And here, actually, we had an example of this this evening uh, on 6.3 D, uh, inserting the language or speak without recognition. Uh, so counselors shall not interrupt a colleague or speak without recognition except to raise a point of order, to express a point of personal privilege, and then insert the language to call the previous question. Um, just a question for Mandy. Um, I always think of that as singular. Does it make a difference? Is the language? I think it's a typo. I think it should be singular. Okay, that was my thought. So it should be to call the previous question. So again, just inserting those two uh, phrases. Um, and we had an example of that this evening. The second proposed change uh, is to uh, move the three minute uh, limit to two minutes. Okay, and that's six three. And again, the argue, the rationale here, I think, is um, uh, basically meetings that go to 11, 11.30, sometimes to midnight. Um, I don't think this alone by any means would, would shorten it, but it might make at least a small dent in uh, the amount of time that we seem to spend. Um, so these were both uh, offered as ways to uh, help somewhat in shortening the length of our meetings. 8.1, introdu introduction of bylaws and other measures. Again, this is an insertion of a large body of text. Um, there had been, I, I think, a fair amount of confusion, um, particularly about introdu introduction, who can introduce general bylaws, but there also was some, uh, some clarity among some about zoning bylaws. So what this language does is it spells out specifically um, who may introduce, uh, first of all, a general bylaw, and it lists four um, ways in which that can be done. Uh, zoning bylaws, as I'm sure many of you know, are governed by mass general law, um, but you do, we do have some uh, freedom as well uh, to provide for other avenues. And so here are listed nine ways in which a, a zoning bylaw could be presented. So the purpose here was to make explicit um, and, and clear who can bring bylaws um, forward. That's 8.1. Uh, rule uh, ROP 9.5, the last one um, in my list here, basically this was uh, necessitated by the recent signing on January 4th of 2021 by Governor Baker of the House Bill and Act Enabling Partnerships of Growth. Um, because of these changes, it actually changes um, the various quanta that are required for certain votes. And so this is basically housekeeping. Um, the language here does not get into all the details of the law, which is quite complicated. Um, so in the first example, it simply strikes uh, the first uh, instance because that no longer applies. And in the other two examples, it uses the word certain and gives you the reference um, because now certain zoning bylaws uh, changes in accordance with this, this law um, now require uh, nine votes and some require uh, at least seven votes. So this is really a housekeeping measure based on um, a recent law that has been signed uh, by the governor. And so those are the uh, proposed changes. And as I said, they were recommended to you by GOL in two separate votes, um, both of them unanimous. 
In one case, or in the second case, it was a slightly different committee because we had just changed membership. Um, but in both cases, the votes were unanimous. I'm going to ask you to leave this. Well, we, we may come back to it depending on uh, the questions. So let's start with uh, the recommended change to Rules of Procedure 2.1. Alyssa? We're doing these one at a time, right? And yeah. so um, I just want to point out that you scared the heck out of me when you said secret ballot because obviously that's I illegal. I it's a, but like you said tonight, it's a I'm, written ballot, and I appreciate I appreciate the concept there, right? Okay. Because once all the other votes have been taken, you're like, well, why should I bother voting? So I totally understand that, and uh, you know, we it's a roll call world we're in for Zoom. So thank you for that. And I think that's really important to be clear to people that it's just a written ballot, but that way they're all turned in at the same time. I think that's actually quite helpful. Okay. Any other comments on 2.1? Again, we're not voting tonight. This has to come before the council twice. And so it'll be on the agenda uh, in two weeks. Um, 4.3 was a simple change from shall to may. Any comments? And then 5.7 was trying to put in place a process by which we um, can do follow charter section 8.1, which is about meeting of residents and the collection of 200 signatures of people 18 years and older. Are there any questions on that one? Yes, Alyssa. Yes, thank you. Um, the concern I have associated with that one is because we have the rather awkward definition of town bulletin board and town calendar um, available to us in our charter, something that didn't exist under the old town government act. I want to point out that the most recent open meeting of the residents was not listed on the town calendar as a posted meeting. I think it will be a good choice for us to do that to enable bodies to, to enable us as a body to deliberate rather than to just listen. We may choose to have one that's just listening, that's an open meeting of the residents that's just listening, but if we're gonna do anything like deliberation, it should be a posted meeting. And putting it on the town bulletin board, while is what it says for town bulletin board in the charter, does not actually make it a posted meeting because if that was true, then all our town council meetings would be on the town bulletin board and they aren't. So I asked George to clarify this uh, when this came up and he said, well, I think we did. And I said, no, I don't think we quite did. So I would just ask that you go back and tweak that a little bit to make it clear that open meetings of the residents, if deliberations intended by the body need to be posted the same way. And like, cause we're talking about town council here, right? We're not talking about school committee or the library trustees that we would post it as a meeting, not just advertise it as a public forum that didn't have a meeting associated with it. Let me just um, add to that, that as Alyssa, I think, just alluded to, these are our rules for following 8.1 of the charter. The school committee and the Jones Library can make up their own rules. Ha the other thing I want to point out is it has been our practice to, in fact, always post it as a meeting um, on the calendar. So um, that I'm totally in support of that continuing practice. Are there any other comments on this one? Okay, then the, the one on 6.3, it had two parts. One was to limit from three to two minutes. And the other one was about interruption, I think it was. No, it was about uh, calling the question. Calling, uh, calling the, question. the previous question would be also uh, something you could do without being recognized formally. Okay, Darcy. Yeah, <clears throat> I just wanted to say I had a very nice first meeting with GOL uh, where we actually unanimously agreed on everything, <laughs> including all the rule changes we deliberated. Um, but the meeting before that, uh, the, the one before I joined, there were a couple of rule changes that were in um, 6.3. And um, I believe shortening our meetings um, can be done in other ways than limiting our speech. Um, I, I strongly believe that we need to leave the time limit to three minutes 
which is standard in um, in meetings like ours, um, and and a reasonable number. I think two minutes is too short, um, and would and it would actually disadvantage um, the minority. I mean, it would disadvantage anyone who wants to speak for three minutes. Um, I also believe there's uh, absolutely no need to interrupt our colleagues to call the question. I find that very unfriendly and not in keeping with the values we've set out for the tone of our meetings. And that also disadvantages the minority where the majority opinion can simply cut off a minority opinion like was done tonight, actually. Uh, and there's no reason why um, we can't wait three minutes to call the question between speakers and give the respect to a person who wants to make, to say their piece. And I, um, so that's basically what I think about those two. Okay. Alyssa? So I know everybody's going to laugh hysterically when I say, uh, I don't want to be limited in how long I talk, obviously, but I, I want to make the reference for people is that this is not representative town meeting. Okay, representative town meeting had three minutes. And remember, representative town meeting didn't have open meeting law. Representative town meeting members could talk to each other all night long, could talk to each other for weeks ahead of time at all hours in any grouping and make decisions about things and think through what they were thinking about a warrant article. I'm one of the people who is pushing us to not refer things to committee if it's not gonna be a value add for that committee to be able to get more done. If we only talk about things at town council, or if we only talk about them at town council, I mean, we say, oh, well, you only get two minutes, then that, as following up on what Darcy said with a slightly different flavor, is what that does is that tells me I now have to go to every council committee meeting where they're possibly discussing things, because obviously I should have gone to these GOL meetings so that I could say no, even though I would have been outvoted, on this change from three to two. And I, that's not a good use of my time as a town councilor to go around telling other town council committees how to behave. So I don't think this makes sense. I think if we are looking at ways to cut our agenda down, there are some other things like the length of presentations that we receive, the number of presentations we get per town council meeting, the goal of changing us from two to three advantages people making a two minute canned speech that's not at all responsive to what the person before said. It's just, oh, I got to get my two minutes in. It, it's not a good plan. Andy. So I uh, will resist temptation to tell you why I'm so unhappy and even angry about what happened on that motion to call a previous question. However, what I really want to do right now is single on a very simple thing, and that is to invite somebody on the council to interrupt in the middle of somebody's two or three minutes of speaking to call a previous question, I think is um, inviting another level of rudeness. Okay. Um, Kathy. Yeah, I, I'm going to echo what was just said and try to say it a little bit differently. Um, I, I totally agree on the interruption. I don't think you should be able to inter interrupt someone. Um, I would have preferred on the thing that went just we just had is that if there was a person who was seconding a motion, someone else might have wanted to call the question, but it was almost like in the same breath and it felt very planned to me. And I would like to think that we're not doing that. Um, whether or not it warranted having a discussion is another issue. So I would not be in favor of this. It's okay to interrupt to call a question. I think um, num that's number one. And on the two to three minutes, I think three minutes is critical. Uh, some of us, I'm probably um, on this end, tend to talk too fast anyway, but I don't talk that long unless I can add I think we have to be able to have debates and we have to be able to go back and forth and making conversations ever shorter. We won't be able to do that. Um, we are only a body of 13 people. I would shorten the agendas 
as Alyssa suggested, by shortening some of the presentation, I thought the 5.30 to 6.31 tonight, the presentation could have been a half hour rather than an hour. And I, we might not have control over UMass, but there were more questions that could have been answered. So I think just being much more disciplined on the amount of time for presentation to allow more time for discussion is critical. And we have to be able to have this. I, I think running around to committees to get your other two cents in is not a way to use our time. I, um, and if the meeting goes longer, if it's substantive, it's important. We should be able to speak, hear somebody, wait a while, and talk again if there's a discussion. That's what we should be doing when we're deliberating. Otherwise, we're not deliberating. Uh, Steve. Yes, I'm going to jump on the uh, bandwagon of when can you interrupt, but Robert's rule spells out when you can interrupt. And so I, I don't see why we would be going away from Robert's and calling the question is not one of the reasons for interruption. Okay, Dorothy. I, I think the most important point is to remind us that this is open meeting law and just to think about what if you are somebody public watching this meeting? If the meeting were an absolutely totally efficient one with all kinds of items on the consent agenda, and listen, I do understand why that's being used, in which if you haven't done your research, you have no idea what's going on. And then debate is cut down. Then they're gonna say, oh, this is just something different people get together behind, I just forget open meeting, and they talk it out amongst themselves. And then they come and they just do the votes in public there's no reason for me to attend this meeting as an informed citizen. So I think that we can have fewer items or there are a variety of things we can do to, to shorten the meeting. But I think we do have to have the right to have some discussion and crosstalk because we're not allowed to do this outside of meeting. You know, and I'm not doing it. I am not breaking open meeting law. So um, democracy does take some time, but we're trying to show that we're a democratic town council. So I think we need to take some time. Andy Joe. So I wanna mention a few things. Um, one is it's been very few times that speakers tonight have even exceeded two minutes of talking. I've been watching the clock. Um, but beyond that, these rule changes do not prohibit a counselor from speaking more than once. Um, I want to point people to section B. Um, well, not section, sorry, when it's section C, um, you have to wait your turn again, but you still get two more minutes if you want to speak a second time. So it's not like we're cutting people off with only one chance to speak um, with this change from three to two minutes. Um, and the other thing I'm hearing about section D is that people are really concerned about someone calling the previous question by interrupting a colleague versus by speaking without recognition. And so I, I hear the concerns there, and I know GOL struggled with how to get this in there um, as another potential way of shortening meetings, because right now um, you'd have to wait your turn in line. If there's 12 other people that speak in front of you and you want to call the question, you have to wait potentially 30 some minutes before you even get a chance to call the question. So I think there might be a way to revise section D to not allow a previous question to be called through interruption, but still allow a previous question to be called essentially between speakers by not needing recognized. And maybe that's something we could bring um, to the council next week um, as an amendment to the original motion. Okay. Uh, Steve Schreiber. And uh, just the counter argument is if there are 12 people that wanna speak, I assume it's an important um, topic to be discussing. And I assume that those 12 people that have their hands up will not vote yes to call the question because they have their hands up. So yeah, so then actually that may in fact delay the meeting because then we have to have the whole um, vote for the call in the question. So Okay, are there any other, yes. Uh, Steve, you still have your hand up. Is there more? Okay. Are there any other comments on uh, 6.3? Okay. 8.1 
was the whole section on how bylaws can be brought forward. Are there comments? Okay, I'm not seeing any there. Um, and 9.5 was uh, housekeeping, basically bringing it into compliance with the new state law. Any comments or questions? Kathy. Um, yes, I, I understand, uh, George said, for efficiency purposes, we are just cross-referencing. But I think it is important to say what we mean here. So I would, um, whatever the artful way of doing this, you have to read the state law that was just passed so carefully to figure out what under certain circumstances are. I don't think we should have an operating rule for ourselves, which require us to have the 150 page document to find that piece. So I think we should be, if we're going to say, in certain circumstances, it's a majority. We should have a little asterisk and say, these are the circumstances or see page whatever for these circumstances. And I'm assuming when we bring our, um, some of the things, cause it also has for special permits and a couple other places that votes could be a majority rather than a super majority um, that, we're going to have to do that in our zoning law as well, but I think we should spell them out because otherwise we're not guiding ourselves here. Um, I would doubt of the 13 people here, all but a handful of us could say what the special circumstances are. And so I, 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 a document that doesn't tell you what it is you're setting up a rule for yourself on voting it is um, without going to find another document where it may not say in a specific place what these are, I think is faulty. So I would just include them. And as I said, there's some artful way of doing this, whether it's a footnote, whether in its appendix and say, these are the circumstances. And if we're not completely clear about that yet, I would wait for this housekeeping thing till we have the exact things we're talking about. Um, George? I have a suspicion, Kathy, that you did not read the KP Law Memo, though maybe you did. Oh, um, I, did. I did read the KP okay, Memo. Then, then you know that it's extremely complicated and that uh, putting in an asterisk will not cut, cut the mustard. Um, this will become a document in itself. So uh, maybe what we just do is just drop the whole thing. But here it's simply alerting people to the fact that there are certain uh, zoning bylaw changes that require X number of votes and certain to require other votes. And to specify them in any detail, I think would make this cumbersome beyond, um, beyond belief. Um, so we'll look into it. But I would be more, I would be more comfortable with saying generally it's this, the supermajority, but a new law has passed and there are, but to, to say that we are a different number for as yet to be described circumstances in well, our own. Described, but you're gonna to have to read that uh, law in great detail and the zoning people, I'm sure the planning people are looking through it now with a fine tooth comb. So um, I would not encourage us to try and, and, and parse that here in detail at this stage. This is simply uh, alerting people to the fact that uh, if they, you know, want to know what the, the numbers, the situations are, they're going to need to consult an expert. It's gotten very complicated, for better or worse. I don't know, but it's just gotten complicated. I don't know if Mandy has thoughts on this. Maybe your thought is, Mandy, that we can go in this thing and unpack it, but uh, life is short. And uh, I'm not sure I really want to try and, and identify every single case. Um, I think it's, it's really complicated. Well, maybe the way to do it then is leave it's generally nine the way we had it done and then have an asterisk. There are going to be other circumstances. You know, I just, it, it's, I'm very uncomfortable with saying it's majority in some other circumstances that I'm not going to tell you about right now in our own rule. And I, do understand, why, that, right? I do understand why you've written it that way. Yeah. But. Mandy Jo. Thank you. So, it won't be hundreds of pages anyone has to go through. Right now, it hasn't been incorporated into MGL Chapter 40A Section 5 because it is a brand new session law. So it is only found in the Acts 
of 2021, 2020 chapter, whatever, which is a hundred page document. Um, you know, you could put the actual section five in the rules, but then every time section five changes, we have to change the rules. And section five is not something I would be comfortable with as a town councilor putting in the rules and saying, hey, I don't need to consult the town attorney now because the rules tell me which of these zoning bylaws needs seven versus nine. They are so specific and you have to be able to interpret them so cleanly about does this specific bylaw change for zoning affect this one area that has the seven, you know, the simple majority language now to allow a simple majority vote, or does it not fall into that, that we're going to need an attorney now to determine which of our zoning bylaw provisions, um, you know, will need seven versus nine. And so I disagree completely trying to actually write that in our rule. The rule here is to give us an idea of, you know, to, to as George said, um, signal how many votes are needed for what. And this one now, given the law, is too complicated that we're going to need town council, town attorney opinion on every single zoning matter we vote on, on how many votes are required. So this is now to signal hey, go find an attorney opinion to tell you how many votes you need. Um, okay, are there any other comments? So at this point, uh, basically the areas that I think we have asked GOL to look back at is the section uh, 6.3 regarding time limit and the call the question issue. And then on this last one, it's, I don't know what, what can be done, but it's, it's basically there. And then I leave it to GOL to tell me whether or not you are ready to bring this back uh, for the next council meeting or you need longer, okay? Based on whatever your agendas are. I think Lynn also 8.1, uh, Alyssa had some uh, very specific uh, concerns. We would also look at that. Yes, thank you, I'm sorry. It's all right, there's a lot there, yeah. Got it. Okay. Um, that is we're up to count committee and liaison report, I believe. Yes, we are. Um, so, uh, uh, CRC, Mandy Jo. Yeah, um, we had a joint meeting with the planning board last week. Um, it was a very good meeting. Um, we will continue receiving, we're gonna get a draft work plan from the planning department on zoning priorities um, tomorrow. Uh, we will also be talking about the climate um, goal of the housing policy and the strategies that could help um, implement that goal tomorrow as a first look um, and more discussion on the client uh, the comprehensive housing policy outreach to various members i think the plan right now is to bring that draft comprehensive policy to um a very rough draft not a recommended version from crc but to bring a rough a draft to the council at the march 8th 2021 meeting for full discussion um before uh, so crc can take those uh, thoughts and feedback into consideration as it continues to refine that draft housing policy. Mandy Jo, do you think that you will also be ready along with the planning staff to do an update on the zoning priorities and work plan on the 8th as well or earlier? Um, probably the 22nd we could do that uh, given what I've been hinted at that planning staff will have for us tomorrow in terms of what that work plan is. Um, not any type of discussion on substantive actual zoning priorities. They will not be coming to CRC from what I've heard until early March. Okay. So we'll stay in touch and see whether or not February 22nd is reasonable. Yep. Okay. Um, uh, elementary school building, any further uh, update, Kathy? The only update is to build on um, what build on um, the what we said last time. We're in the process of drafting the request for services for uh, a project manager for the project. Um, Steve's on the subcommittee for that, and we are going to be invited in by MSBA on Thursday to do that. So it will be the official. 
you're ready to go. So we're trying to get the draft as near to final for the full committee so then we can um, move forward with it. So there will be, yes. Right, the elementary and secondary board meets on Thursday for that vote, or MSBA. Yes. Meets on they, Thursday for that vote, yes. And, and so that that's the official you're in. And so we our our committee, the full committee will be meeting next week after we've been invited in. And meanwhile, we have a subcommittee that's hoping to bring them a draft of the request for services. Andy. Uh, finance. Uh, yeah, finance committee. Uh, I could go on for a long time, but I'm not going to because of the hour and I'm going to cut it to what is that up at our next meeting because I want to uh, make sure that all of you are aware of it. Um, we have been expecting that Sean Bangano would take the um, model that had been previously used and um, update it with new sets of presumptions and analysis for the four major building projects and uh, presented to the finance committee for our discussion. And that is scheduled for um, the, our next meeting on February 16th at two o'clock. And uh, so I wanted to alert you to it. I think that there had been a question of uh, whether it should be even a meeting of the whole for the council. I don't think it needs to be, but I do think that uh, um, anybody who's interested in hearing that initial presentation um, and uh, wants to be able to um, ask questions should uh, uh, certainly attend that meeting. And uh, I think that's, that's the most important thing now. Um, we are now switched our schedule to coordinate with CRC so that we are meeting the first and third um, Tuesdays and uh, CRC is meeting second and fourth and um, Tuesdays. Um, so that's what our new schedule is. Um, in the meeting after, we probably will be taking up um, a more extensive uh, follow-up discussion on the uh, wastewater um, provisions. Uh, some research has been done on questions that were raised at the last discussion that the finance committee had. Um, just a clarification at this point, we were planning to go ahead and call the meeting on the 16th at two o'clock uh, committee of the whole so that people could ask questions um, as well. Um, and I'll, pro we'll pro I'll have Athena poll to see if in fact, people are able and planning to attend on that day. Uh, JCPC, Kathy. Oh, I'm sorry, GOL, George. Uh, future items are in the report. You've heard enough from us tonight, so nothing more. Okay. JCPC, Kathy. It's short. We have our first meeting on Thursday. Thanks to the members of TSO for reorganizing their life around us. Um, we found a time, seven o'clock at night on Thursdays, or when we're going to be meeting. And we're going to be meeting every week um, to, to bring... Uh, the decisions back. So uh, that's it. That's the beginning of JCPC for this round. Great. Uh, TSO, Darcy? Yeah, um, TSO is going to be electing a chair on Thursday. Um, and also on that date, and like Kathy said, um, TSO is going to be meeting at 5 p.m. Um, on that agenda, we're going to have the uh, West Pomeroy Village Center project and revisions of the public way policy that were uh, proposed by the town manager a while back. Um, and at the meeting on February 25th, we're going to be looking at the surveillance technology bylaw, um, the permanent shelter issue, and um, the wayfinding signs. Okay. Are there any liaison reports? Okay. Uh, we've approved the minutes, so we'll move on to the town manager's report. Thank you. I know you're over four hours already, so um, 
just want to note that our um, hotline vaccination uh, program has gone remarkably well. So appreciate all this town staff that have done that. The hotline, we continue to monitor and answer all the questions in real time. Um, the state has put out a 211 number. We're not recommending, we're not advising people to call that number. You get a voicemail and they say they call you back in 72 hours. We're trying to answer all of our residents' um, calls in real time or call. we will call you back for sure. Um, the things coming up on uh, Thursday, we do our community chat. It'll be with Ben Brigger to talk about the wayfinding. If, if members of the public want to talk about to the presenter tonight, they have that opportunity on Thursday at noon. Uh, the following week, we'll be talking about the North Amherst Library. Um, and the week after that, the 25th, we'll be talking about the Jones Library. Um, on February 19th, uh, we'll have a cup of Joe, which is a Friday morning, and that's where we'll have Sean Mangano. That will be a meeting for after the town council has received the presentation on the four capital projects that uh, Mr. Steinberg referenced. Um, and then the Mass School Building Authority uh, Kathy already mentioned. So if there are any questions, I'm here to answer them. Paul, uh, I'll take questions in a moment, but are those uh, community chats recorded? Yes, they are. And they're actually, since since they're only 30 minutes, they actually are one of the uh, more popular things <laughs> to get watched because they're so short. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I, I just wanted to make sure that, you know, for comments, for instance, on wayfinding, the TSO can refer to that as well. We can share it. That's a good idea. Are there questions of the town manager regarding this report? Okay, seeing none. Um, I very last minute sent you the beginning of the draft of the annual calendar. I only got through June and tonight I can't hold it up so you can see, but it's got arrows going this way with circles going that way with changing dates already, which is one of the reasons why it's a living document. But let me just point out that on the next meeting, uh, the Jones Library will be making a presentation and there's a little editorial. I have already gone over their outline. I have suggested times for each of the items so that it is no more than a total of an hour it's a very lengthy presentation. And I've also asked for other detail in their presentation. As an editorial note, I did the same thing for UMass and the town of Amherst. I asked that they do theirs in 20 minutes today and that the town do theirs in 10 and you saw the product of that. So thank you, I, I am trying. <laughs> um, the annual audit will also come to the council on uh, February 22nd. Uh, if TSO is ready, the public way policy will come to the council and uh, the rules of procedure, if they're ready, will come for second reading and the update on the zoning priorities and the work plan from the planning staff and CRC. Those are the highlights. Um, and then we move into March. And I have asked that committee chairs look at this. It's no way complete. Uh, but are there questions? Mandy Jo. Yeah, if my memory serves me correct, the public way policy was referred to both TSO and GOL, and I believe GOL was waiting for TSO to discuss it themselves before it went to GOL. So I'm not sure the 22nd is the right day. Absolutely correct. Okay. I'm actually fine taking that off of the next meeting's agenda since we may also get planning back. Anything else? Any other questions at this time? Okay, we have one item that is um, the, um, under the 48 hour rule. And this arose, um, well, Monday, uh, actually I guess it arose on Saturday, but didn't actually take form until today. And that is a joint resolution, although we have it billed as a single resolution. It's with the school committee and it is um, around moving teachers up in priority 
for the vaccination. And uh, it was in your packet. Kathy Shane is the sponsor and she worked with uh, Carrie Spitzer. And then Mandy Jo helped put it in the format it needs to be. And so I hope we're looking at the right version. This is the most recent version with Kathy and Mandy's changes. Okay. Okay. And um, that please take a little time to read it since it did not go into the packet until the very last minute. Um, and Kathy, go ahead. I'm just going to uh, say a couple words about it. Um, Athena needs to scroll down if you're going to scroll to where the most recent changes because it wasn't in the packet. But what the background of this is, I listened to the um, community hearing, the public hearing that was the school committee had on Thursday night, where over 170 people were out in the audience. And the testimonies that people were giving, both pediatricians and uh, uh, medical staff that takes care of our kids and parents were both vivid and heart wrenching um, when you talk when they were talking about what the impact has been on kids on not being in person in classroom, and uh, what has come out, uh, what the governor has done um, with the phases is that phase two teachers were supposed to originally be in group two, and they move the governor reprioritized and moved them down to group three. So this rev resolution would move them back up again to group two to put them in with 65 year olds, which is the next group out to be um, eligible to get vaccines. And I originally wrote a letter, I drafted a letter that the council could send because I it was triggered by me asking our representatives, Senator, um, Comerford and Dom, um, whether I could volunteer as a, a an over 70 year old, but I won't qualify to, until 65, could I give up my slot for a teacher? And they said, no, you cannot give up your slot for a teacher. They have to be in the same group. So this is the only way of doing it, even if some of us are, who are in isolation would be to promote them. Meanwhile, Carrie Spitzer had drafted a resolution that will come up for the school committee tomorrow and some sharp eyes uh, both Mandy and Alyssa noticed there was one error in it that we fixed that I clear that it's moving teachers from being group three to group two and it's more explicit about that in the resolution and I cleared this edit to Carrie's with Carrie as what she would want to do for tomorrow so she has yet to submit her original draft. So we are um, working on something that she has approved. And that's in the resolve, therefore, that it says moving them back into or moving them into group two of phase two. We're in phase two right now. And they're just, they're queued up to be group three. So group two isn't in yet. Um, so that's what the resolution is. Moves them up. Uh, while we're reading, Alyssa. So just proving that I can literally offend absolutely everyone with uh, one single statement. I can't vote for this tonight. And there are a couple of reasons for that. One, I absolutely believe that teachers should be vaccinated, staff and any staff that comes into contact with students should be vaccinated before they're back in the schools. I 100% believe that. I know that what we're doing right now is moving toward putting them in the schools without having them vaccinated because of this weird situation Massachusetts finds itself in. And I don't support that. I support making sure they've gotten at least the first of their two vaccines. At the same time, because of the weird mess we have, as Kathy indicated, that the priorities have shifted over time. And individuals age 65 plus, which again, all my friends who are over 65, many of which are retired and can stay home, are already, have been now pushed ahead of early childhood workers, grocery store workers, full disclosure, one of my adult children works in a grocery store, um, vaccine development workers, food pantry workers, 65 year olds in perfect health are ahead of all these front facing people who've been serving all those people since the pandemic started. So 
I'm really unhappy with the fact that the age 65 got bumped up. Yes, I understand the statistics on death and complications, but that to me is the problem. Taking teachers, which in our particular situation are not actually in the schools and putting them ahead of the vaccine line of people who work at the survival center or like my son does at the grocery store, more so than they already are because they're in group three, feels really wrong to me. So again, I want teachers to be vaccinated before they're back in schools. I totally hear the pressures that parents are facing keeping their kids at home. And the whole thing is just an unhappy making mess as we heard from Representative Dom and Senator Comerford this morning. That's why I'm voting against it because of those complications. George. I'm not sure it's a reason to vote for or against the, this proposal, but did we not hear just an hour or two ago from Mindy Dom that this has absolutely no chance of uh, changing the governor's mind? Did I miss, mishear that? Maybe I did. It's been a long no, time. She, she felt she feels there is no way to change the governor's mind. So maybe our focus should be somewhere else. Um, we're in a situation where um, uh, negotiations have simply ceased. Um, the union is unwilling to come forward and, and consider any change to their refusal to come back to teach. So I'm wondering, rather than spending the time on this, maybe we need to, to talk as a group about what we think should happen um, that we could actually perhaps have real influence on, as opposed to sending off a resolution that we've been told by our representative really doesn't have any chance of doing anything. Okay. Mandy Joe. I'm going to agree with Alyssa and George. Now that I've seen the first, therefore be it resolved, I'm not sure I can support it. I was already questioning prioritizing them in phase three or group three over those workers who have already been in person and been working in person for 11 months now. Um, and the new wording of this says, don't even just do that you know, don't, don't move everyone in that phase, that group up to above the original wording had moving group three above the 65 year olds again, but now it's just moving educators up and still leaving essential workers below. Um, and as Alyssa said, I've always had problems with what the governor's done. Um, I understand in some sense what the governor's done, but I don't think I can agree to move only educators above 65 year olds, it has to be the whole group. Uh, Steve. So I'm gonna be a voice in support of this because on the principle that literally the first thing one has to do in a community after there's a disaster, like a earthquake or a hurricane is get the schools open because without the schools open, then the parents can't, the, basically the parents are locked into into their houses. So I, I think that it's it's terrible that the teachers were moved off that priority list. And I think that this is an important message, whether or not it changes the governor's mind. I, I still think that it's a really important message to send. Shalini? Yeah, I would support it for some of the reasons that Steve mentioned that also it's, um, I mean, whether it does anything or not, but if everyone does sense a resolution like this and puts pressure, maybe it will make a difference. At least we're doing something while we also consider other alternatives which George recommended. And I mean, it's, it's really hard, the question of prioritizing the teachers over others. And I don't know what the answer is to that, um, but could we th say that children who don't have, who are getting, you know, affected by it. Um, and there's just so much that's affecting kids. And I'm, it's really bad for other frontline workers. But it just feel and I have no basis to say one way, but in my mind, it feels like adults have some capacity to deal with these things. And children who are getting affected, it might be a a very long-term damage that's done. And um, and it also affects their parents who are workers. And so it feels okay to push for teachers before others. But again, it sounds horrible to say it that way, but I don't know what the research is on that. 
Dorothy? Um, although there are good arguments against supporting this, I support it for the, not because of the teachers, but because of the children. The damage to children as they develop that has happened in this past year may never be corrected. And I'm talking about emotional damage of a great type, which I have seen, I saw it as it was happening with my grandchildren. I don't know if it will be repaired in time. So I'm talking about emotional damage. Now add that to some children whose parents aren't professors. So now we have emotional damage and we have great loss of education and intellectual damage that their parents might find it harder to keep up. So it's not because teachers versus other workers. It's purely because we have done something terrible to the children in this town. And it's gonna be hard trying to catch up, but we should do anything we can to bring them back into school, into human contact as soon as we can. Darcy. I think it's really important that we support um, the teachers on this, um, but I do, uh, I do think that the other essential workers are also important. So I'm wondering if we could just amend the resolution so that we are supporting moving the the, the third group up above the 65 year olds because then teachers would have the same benefit they would be able to get they would they would be able to get their um, vaccines earlier but so would the essential workers the other essential workers I'm not saying we shouldn't do that Darcy I'm just going to say that if we're going to do that, then we should refer it to GOL and to the sponsor and not try to edit it tonight in the meeting. Is it time sensitive? Um, it, it's all time sensitive. I, I, you know, the school committee will probably vote tomorrow night, whether we vote or not. So I think we need to do what we want to do. And if we want a different resolution than pull it off the table tonight and do a different resolution. But there's other hands up. Um, Kathy? Um, I, I'll just speak quickly to, um, I think if we don't do it tonight, um, then we should go for other kinds of things to speed up the distribution of the vaccine. What I heard last week, um, what Dorothy is saying, I didn't talk long about pediatricians were coming on talking about the psychic damages to little kids that they're seeing in the Amherst kids and not in their Belchertown kids. Parents were coming on and breaking on to tears that they had um, one person had taken a mortgage out on their house to pull their kid out of the public school to get them back into a, 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 a in-classroom situation. Another person was giving up her job so her kid had at least some social contact with somebody. And it was story after story about this that we're, um, and so this this was written to be in support of teachers and getting kids back in the classroom. And that's, I originally wrote it as a simple letter just to raise the priority to show support. And I, I heard what Mindy said and Joe were saying, um, when I asked, last week, right after I heard this, could I give up my slot? Mindy and Joe both wrote me back that they had written letters to the governor and it would be good for the council to do this or for me to do it, to just add another voice um, of protest. Um, so I didn't think of it as lower the 65 year olds back down to group three and move teachers up to group two because Everyone I know in New York who's 65 and older has now got the vaccine. I don't know what's going on in Massachusetts on the distribution, but New York teachers are getting vaccine and the 65 year olds. So I don't know what's happening to the supply chain here, but this was meant to be a support of children and the people who take care of them, the childcare workers and the teachers to allow them to come back into the school system. That's why it's written. So I think if we wanna turn it into something else and we wanna wait, um, hopefully uh, group two will be in soon and then we're in group three. So waiting till 
the end of March and April, then it will really be just a symbolic gesture that won't speed anything up. So I would pull it off the table if people really want to rewrite it. But I, I think it's an important thing for the council. Because we're we're not teachers and so we're not speaking as invested people in the school we're speaking as representatives of the whole town watching this happen amongst us and i don't have kids in the school anymore but i can it was painful to listen to the stories that people were telling george then why don't we actually pass a resolution that might actually have some impact calling the union to come back to the table and for the sake of the children and for the sake of the parents there are teachers all around in this region who are teaching in the schools south hadley is going back um enough is enough um the problem uh, the problem is complex i don't want to make it simple but if you want to feel good and pass this fine i'm not going to vote for it because what we really should be voting on is a resolution that tells the union you must come back to the table and, and bargain in good faith. We have to get the schools open for the kids' sake. Evan? Yeah, I am, I'm sympathetic to Georgia's position. I'm sympathetic to Mandy and Alyssa's position. Um, I think that, you know, my if I was to have proposed this resolution, maybe I would have done it slightly differently to include all of group three and, and push them up. Um, but I'm going to vote in support of the resolution, and I think we should go forward with it tonight. Um, and the reason is that I, I don't think that this is a zero sum game to some extent. I don't think that passing this resolution means that we can't also pass a resolution that is similar to what George wants. I don't think that passing this resolution means that we can't come back um, in two weeks from now and say, remember when we said we think that we need to move teachers up? We also really want to see food pantry workers and grocery store personnel also move up. Um, I don't. I don't think that doing this um, precludes us from doing any of those other things. But I think that this is made more powerful if it's paired with action by the school committee. Um, and I think that focusing just on teachers for this resolution, in my mind at least, certainly in my heart, does not diminish. Um, the, the real need of all of the other essential workers that are also listed in group three. It's just calling one particular group out for this resolution that's being passed to some extent jointly with the school committee to say, hey, we want to put this on your radar. This is really important. And if we want to do other things, if we want to use, I mean, it, this is a crisis, right? We should be using all of the tools in our toolbox. And if this is one tool, that doesn't mean we can't also in a couple of weeks from now, grab another tool from the toolbox and do that. So even though I, I certainly understand some of the arguments against, um, I, will, I will be supporting this. Shalini. Ooh, I think I was going to say exactly the same things as Evan and, uh, and, and also that whether we want to pressure, I mean, and that's a discussion to be had, whether we want teachers to be back in the school without vaccinations. I mean, that's a discussion and we have to look at the pros and cons. So I think that needs to be done and it should be done, but it's a separate conversation. And today I think we should just act on this and focus in on just the teachers. Pat? Thank you. Uh, I'm going to vote against this. Um, I feel strongly that um, we should be sending a resolution that speaks to all the workers uh, in uh, group three. Uh, I'm going to be 75 in March. I would, I'm, you know, in line to get it. I'd like Kathy, I'd give up my place. In many ways, I think uh, elderly people should step back. Um, but most importantly right now to me is the very people who are low-income workers are in incredible amount of danger and no one is caring about them um, in our government, in our, certainly not our governor. So I cannot support this because it singles out teachers as being more important than my friend who works at the grocery store or volunteers at the survival center and things like that. Can't support it. Andy Joe. 
So I have a kid in the Amherst Public Schools, and I've been following this very closely since last summer. And the Amherst Public Schools are one of the only schools in this county that have had barely any in-person schooling all year. And it's because there was a bad MOU signed between the union and the school committee. And this resolution does nothing about that. I fear that even if the school, the educators get moved up in the line, they will still refuse to come back to school in this town because they're gonna then claim that the students aren't immunized. Because if you remember back in the spring and the summer in August, when the original negotiations on that MOA started, the union came in with 100% immunization of staff and students before educators would go back into the schools. And that was their starting position. So I don't know whether this resolution will help or not. We have a crisis in this town with education, but it's not because our educators are not vaccinated because plenty of educators in this county, in this state have been educating our K-12 populations in person safely without actual transmission of COVID in the schools. And you know what? I watched that same thing. My husband signed the open meeting request. I would have, except I'm a town official, so I thought it inappropriate for me to actually ask the school committee to sign that. But what he heard was we have KN95 masks, a half a million or something of them. And his response was, oh my God, they have the best ones and the teachers still aren't willing to go back. So we, we can do this resolution all we want. I'm not sure it will convince our union to actually go back and teach our kids in person. And that's the broken part of our town right now. And I'm sorry we've gone to this and this is a council thing, but I don't know how to get that union and that school committee to be talking to each other, but they aren't. And there's a refusal. And I know there are a number of parents, no matter how bad our kids are suffering, that have given up hope that we will ever see in-person learning this school year, no matter when those educators are vaccinated. And that's the horrible thing about this entire situation. And it's going to affect budgets going forward next year and all of that. And so I hate saying I can't support this, but I just can't because it's not the solution we need in this town. Andy. I'll try and be real quick. Um, one, and I guess that I feel like we should be supportive of another elected board under the circumstance and the school committee has uh, kind of asked us to do this, to be supportive of them. Uh, second is that what I heard uh, Senator Comerford say is that while she was skeptical that, that it would make a difference to the governor that the legislature welcomes hearing from the town of Amherst. And I think that she was encouraging us to speak our mind about it. And finally, I think it is about the kids. I agree. It's a really hard and difficult time for parents and, um, and children, especially. And by, and there's no guarantee that as Mandy Jo said, getting the vaccination is going to do anything, but it does strengthen our, our, our school committee's ability to bargain with the unions if that does happen. So if we can pressure for that, we should continue. I mean, what else are we doing? We should be looking at other, all. let's have a discussion. Let's dedicate time to brainstorm and work on that separately, but let's not lose this as who knows why give this opportunity up? And as Andy said, we are supporting our school committee. So I don't see what is the downside uh, of supporting it for the reasons that are being shared right now. So I'm fully in support of it and let's do it. I'm, I'm going to, um, before I call, before we take the vote, I'm going to vo voice, my, voice my own opinion. I regret that this does not include the other direct workers. On the other hand, 
like at least six or seven of us that attended the meeting last week, it's about the kids. And if there's other resolutions that people want to bring forward that um, I think that we all should consider those as well. Um, but for me, it's let's at least try to move this piece of it, whether it goes any place or not. Pat? I just want to add uh, quickly that if we're concerned about children, we should be concerned about children in families that live in small in, uh, apartments and other things uh, whose parents can't get vaccinated and who are working in grocery stores, et cetera. Um, I think our priorities are a little topsy-turvy here and we're protecting um, an elite. Um, that doesn't need protection right now than any more than any other citizen. Okay. Are there any other comments? Okay. Uh, in order to vote on this, we have to uh, vote on the following. Move to suspend Town Council Rules of Procedure 8.4. It's actually a waiver of 8.6. I'm sorry, 8.6. Uh, so, would you please read a motion that would be acceptable then? To waive Town Council Rules of Procedure Rule 8.6 for the current item. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Uh, we'll vote on that first. And um, I'm just trying to blank blank. Uh, we start with Evan Ross. Aye. George Ryan? Yes. Yeah, Kathy Shane? Yes. Steve Schreiber? Yes. Andy Steinberg? Yes. Sarah Schwartz? Aye. Uh, Shalini Balmilne? Yes. Alyssa Brewer? Aye. Pat DeAngelis? No. Darcy Dumont? Point of order. Yeah. This is just to suspend rule 8.6. Yeah, I understand that. Okay, just to be clear. Thank All you. Right, cool. so, I was just making sure I was clear. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, Darcy. Looks frozen. Oh, okay. Darcy, you need to unmute. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. Thanks. Yes. And Greesmer is an I and Hannah Key. An I. And Pam. I keep doing it too fast. Yes. Okay. So it's um, 12 in favor, one opposed, no abstention, no absence. And we move to the vote. And in this case, we start with George Ryan. No. I need a motion. I'm sorry. Thank you. I'm voting to win nothing. You don't <laughs> nice try, George. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, do you want to formulate a motion, please, for me? To adopt the resolution in support of expedited COVID-19 vaccinations for educators as presented. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Jane. Okay. Um, now we can vote. George Ryan. No. Kathy Shane. Yes. Steve Schreiber. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Sarah Schwartz. Aye. Shalini Balmilne. Yes. Alyssa Brewer. No. DeAngelis. No. Darcy Dumont. Yes. Reese Merzai. Haneke. No. Pam? Yes. Ross? Aye. There is a vote of nine in favor, four against, zero abstentions, and zero um, absence. And so it passes. And uh, unless there's any other business, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Lynn.
Melanie? Uh, Just a quick update on the yes. training, anti-racism training. It's not adjourned. adjourned. <laughs> sorry. Just very quick update that Pat and I are working on you that and that we're, there. what's that? Okay. Just that we are considering a couple of options uh, and we're working around the scheduling at this point and we should have some things, uh, something more concrete very soon. Thank you. Are there other pub are there other comments from counselors? Alyssa, I'm so sorry. Yes. Well, and here we are, and it's only 1019. It's so exciting. Um, yes, I'm, I'm well aware. Thank you. Yes. And I and I also should comment that I appreciate that you did try to limit the presenters, and that's why we need to get you a bigger gavel. But aside from that, um, I'm looking to request an agenda item for February 22nd on what the process is for various community, and this could take a number of different forms. For example, it could be the town manager talking with Lynn and then telling us something. It doesn't have to be a huge discussion, but some sort of processes for various community groups, including reparations for Amherst, which we've gotten emails from on January 27th and February 8th, the appointed community safety working group, other groups like Defund 413, the Racial Equity Task Force, anybody else can apply for funding out of that $80,000 we set aside because that $80,000 is not the Community Safety Working Group budget. It's $80,000 set aside for racial equity, social justice spending. And so although we don't control that, I think we need to be able to tell people like, you go over here and you do this process and it's all done through the town manager because you know that's what we gave them the money for but i think it's unclear to people how that's going to work and that's money that already exists that isn't a future budget request okay i will talk with the town manager and make sure that that's addressed are there other councilor comments okay any other future agenda items Did I cover everything in the agenda before I close the meeting? Yep. All right. The meeting's adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>